Hello from here, which is Berlin for now, which is 10 o'clock in the morning in Berlin. Um, I will follow very straight the title I have been given from our hosts in Australia, where they have more or less uh, six o'clock in the evening now. And the title they were choosing is a shower, a toilet, the bed, the fireplace. Much more than nothing, but that we will find out in the next 15 minutes. So we will follow this suggested title very straight. A shower, a toilet. What you can see here, I will show you the project later on, is ceramics from Luigi Colani from the 1980s. It's mounted on a mirror wall, so this kind of very organic objects uh, are doubled and make a very strange, let's say, more fitting to a biological environment uh, setting. If you go out of the door, which is the bathroom door on the left-hand side, we have a fireplace. You see in the right uh, down corner, you see already a kind of bed, and that's already the whole space. This is a space in the fourth floor of the building, which is in a dense part of Berlin, Berlin Mitte, Brunnenstraße. And on top of this floor, which is the rooftop already, you have a very transparent 1 meter 50 by 1 meter 50 by 1 meter 50 box, which is designed by the office June 14, Sam Chemayev, which is basically our rooftop sauna, or it has been for a whole while. And the whole environment that we are describing in that building is a really hedonistic one, especially when the tenants in third floor made all their parties that were monthly to refinance the whole building. So this was a situation uh, that was left over when the, in the early days of German reunification. So there was this gold rush to Berlin and then they got bankrupt in the early 90s. So that we bought it 15 years later. And you can see this is the front part that we already had a kind of basement with elevator chef. So we knew already where to build. That's how it turns up. It's a very cheap building with polycarbonate facade. It's a self-investment with a group of friends. And it's also used by a group of friends that allowed us not to follow all the requirements that normally uh, German legislation or even worldwide uh, would be asked for. So basically, we just follow the neighboring heights. The polycarbonate is given. Japanese light. In the courtyard, we use the space of the different depths of the neighboring buildings with the outside staircase. And this outside staircase makes a huge difference. So each of the units is addressed via the outside. So there are no corridors, no staircases, nothing. It's just all the space is usable space. And the outside space of the staircase allows all this kind of flow, the semi-public, semi-private flow to the whole building, leading to the parties. And you can see here now what we have seen, the, the sauna on the top where this little bush. It's basically used by gallery spaces that might change one day. And the whole idea of this building is to provide a space that's not predefined, whether it's about working, living, combinations. So to have space, inner city space, that can, accordingly to the surrounding and also to your own needs, shift to any other use. And maybe this kind of openness towards use, here you see like the first adaption that became a living in the third floor, on the right-hand side, meaning then we would have to install another bathtub. And it's always about this core in the middle that provides all tubing, all bathrooms, and it's always bathrooms that are not this kind of luxury private bathrooms, but that would function in an office space as well as in a private space. And then you just add on what you need. So what we are following here 
is a publication that you will see in a moment if you would like to follow up the whole project in a more uh, detailed way. But just to come to one detail that you can see on the left, it's basically just a concrete rack. There is no insulation between the floors beside the concrete slabs. And it's just a very simple construction to mount sliding doors to mount polycarbonate. And polycarbonate is basically chosen also because of the price, because it's a 100 square meter product per square, uh, 100 euro square meter price for this product. So that was just like the last pages out of El Croquis that came out uh, 2018. And the building you can see here in, uh, on the title is the Antivilla in Potsdam. And we turned into that and follow the same routes of toilets, bathrooms, and uh, what, what it can mean if we go beyond this uh, co-use, let's say, or this non-defined use. And uh, we follow up more environmental or uh, questions concerning the heat conditions. So this is uh, an axiomatic drawing of the project after it was completed. You see an inner core, which is providing the whole space. We will come to that later. And a very important part here related to shower, bathrooms, toilet, fireplace, is this curtain you can see. Basically, what we did here is to say we have a sauna as well as you have seen the transparent one before. We have a fireplace that is heating the sauna. We have very close to this, which would be the hottest space then, let's say a 100 degree Celsius space in the sauna made by the fireplace. Then you have directly attached the bathroom, which might have, let's say, 24 degrees. Then you have an inner zone with a curtain that will also in winter time have 18 degrees and the outside temperature might fall down in very heavy winters to five degrees. Meaning that we did not insulate this 1980s building from the outside, but we said, okay, keep everything like it is. And we just use this very thin curtain to produce a kind of uh, temperature difference. So that's how the building looked when we started with uh, the construction. It was an underwear factory, East Germ, so they produced this, yeah, with three gums, no, with three, uh, a very ugly underwear that was, well, maybe used in all over East Germany in, in uh, the pre-unification pre time. So it has a lot of nicknames, but in the end, it's a very ugly building with a lot of small windows and uh, a roof that's made out of asbestos, this undulated plates made out of asbestos. So we had to change the roof anyhow. And with a lot of friends, so I go back and forward maybe for a moment, and just with friends, we broke in those windows because the concrete slab we added on the roof would provide us with a beam also that we could open wherever we like up to five meters and as often we like. And that was basically what we could do with yeah, 20 friends on a Saturday to break four of those holes into the building itself. So this is the inner division, let's say in winter time when the bed is also going into this curtain area. And it's a, a curtain that only has one millimeter of a mesh. That's a maximum because then the airflow is uh, reduced to an amount between the inner space within the curtain and the outside, which is still the usable space, that you can create a temperature difference uh, of about 10 degrees Celsius. So meaning if you have 18 degrees inside the, the curtain, you might have only uh, 10 degrees outside if it's a really harsh window with minus 10 degrees outside. Meaning also that just by the means of a curtain, the whole space get into function, but only together with the fireplace that's heating the sauna and also heating the bathroom. And maybe that's an approach where we found out that the object as we normally calculated that it provides 
let's say this habitat, this house, this villa type, that it provides and normally with a, a condition that's all over the years the same. And basically it was also a financial question. So the whole house, which has like 450 square meters, in the end, it was the same price than a 100 square meter normal house, you no, know, with the normal insulation, normal heating, and all this, let's say, uh, investments that are coming with that. And here we said, okay, let's keep the 450 square meter, and maybe in winter time they have to reduce to 60 square meter, which is under the curtain, meaning that we have most of the year, like 10 months of the year, we would have all the 450 square meters. And this kind of adapting yourself and uh, this kind of change and even a kind of uh, use that's, uh, that's changed is part of the whole concept. And coming to come back to the title you have been choosing to a bed, a fireplace, a shower and a toilet. But that's a sauna heated. And basically that's where the water is coming down now from this concrete roof we added which is with the rainfall, the perfect place after the sauna. And maybe a very last one to show that as we have opened, let's say experimental office in Sicily, from the south of Europe, south of Italy. And it's following more or less the same approach we normally do. So we go for building regulations here. We have a certain volume that you can uh, use. So therefore, it's half dig in into the mountain. It's looking to the sea. And as you can already see, it's a kind of very uh, oriented layout. This is the model, and that's a model made in the scale of uh, 1 to 24, which is the Playmobil scale that kids use. So it's basically my daughter playing with this model and furnishing in and testing it. So, once again, back to the bathroom, you see it's not yet mounted, the sink and the, and the toilet. And that is coming to a maybe important point. So normally what we found out in a lot of buildings we did, this kind of timelessness when it comes to water, uh, hedonism, fire, uh, multi-purpose uses, trigger to make the, uh, the, it, the core of the project to say we have different temperature zones, different climates within the building. We don't want to know when it was built exactly, no? And normally you can detect the, 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 the building year very exactly just by the sanitary objects. So for this one, for the Italian one, we go to auctions and buy this Ant Antonia Campi uh, objects, let's say, water, and, uh, sinks, toilets. Um, that were made in the early 60s, designed in the early uh, 50s, which really changes the tone because then it's a kind of time shift and you don't know where, whether this condition that's given by uh, this information, how water, fire, bed, how this floating areas function, it helps a lot to, to de-address the the year when it was set up and it's the same with the with the Kolani objects you have seen in the first project they're basically from the 80s early 90s so coming out of the time of reunification that uh, that we also just by use and then they get cleaned in a very with acid and all. but so just to follow that project which is stick into the mountain you can see it's more or less the same idea now you have this bathroom inside you have a fireplace. You have this very gorgeous, let's say, place to the, the to the Bay of Castellamare. And what we found out, even if this is not the typical little villa you would find normally in that area as a weekend house, um, it's opening up to a lot of different uses. And maybe to, even if it costs much less, to a kind of much more hedonistic environment that it's dealing with what you would like to ever make it happen. So I would say this is the today's little presentation of a toilet, water, showers, 
and the fireplace. Thanks a lot. We are ready. Hello, everyone. Geometry Simplicity Play is the title put forward by the curators when they invited us to this talk series, which is one half of a book title uh, uh, which we published earlier this year. The second half is exhibiting Vico Magistrate. Geometry Simplicity Play are our own words use on the one end to describe how we understand the work of the Italian architect, but also qualities of our own work. Somehow, somehow the title feels interesting in this moment. In the notes around this lecture series, we were invited to refocus attention to the conceptual, to express complexity simply, and to uncover natural uh, connections. This feeling of simplifying, re-engaging with the familiar is embodied in some of these ideas. 
We will talk about these words and then show you the book a little more. These words, geometry, we mean pure geometry, circles, triangles, squares, rectangles. Simplicity, in magistratian terms, this would be conceptual simplicity. And play, to reinterpret, shift and be delightful. This book is the first of a series we are working on that build all the ideas around one of our projects, which could be a building, a research or lecture. In this case, an exhibition of the archive of Vico Magistretti we designed in 2019. It is the first because this year, it is the centenary of Vico's birth and was designed to complement exhibitions at the Triennale di Milano. Since we've had the need to write something about what interests us in our office, we've had a sentence that reappears more or less in the same form. Our built environments take on simple geometries and restrain material palettes that prioritize the spatial condition and rely on their relationship with landscape in a sort of paradoxical twist to decentralize the object of architecture, being potentially the most object-like we found some freedom in primary geometries. Primary geometries are simple in a way that can be dogmatic and difficult, but also in a way that can be generous to the designer and user. They afford a sense of control and an anonymity in the shape. This is the shape. They afford a great deal of space, air, openness, Simple shapes are at once old and new, not concerned with being modern, able to absorb shifts in culture and technology. They are the familiar shapes of normal things relatively shaped to their task. The funnel, the ruler, a plate. They are also the required ingredients of these quietly super normal things high glasses rationally related to the roundness of the eye, which also frames them. Supernormal is also a term used by Jasper Morrison and Natao Fukusawa in their exhibition at the Triennale di Milano in 2007. The curator Silvana Annicchiarico describes the supernormal object as defined by something that is not present, so normal, they are not normal anymore. A playfulness means the geometry needed be pure. In fact, even better if the triangle is chopped off, super normal. To assign the form to the task at hand and quickly move on is ironic, ironically and after all to assign it utmost importance importance in intention, because it leaves potential rather than dominate or close down. It might seem crude in approach from other say more current, more uh, approaches to creation, where everything is proposed and reproposed and is free from the human body. It's dimensionally related, defined elements of doors and rooms. But we would say in this approach exists an openness for architecture to find new relationships. Since the form is released from its own self, we can more easily see its problematic relationships in its juxtapositions, for example, to the ground, to nature, to the non-human, and find possibilities for it to be redefined. We found ourselves turning again, and pardon the pun, with a new framework to Super Studios geometrical anonymous container put forward in the continuous monument. And so a shift in pace. In 2019, we spent time with the work of Vico Magistretti when designing an exhibition for Vico Magistretti traveling archive. He consistently came to our assistance. The concepts 
of primary geometry, simplicity and play, were used in ways that we hoped would bring the archive alive, which was at the center of the design. The way archives are typically experienced is by sitting down with the material carefully laid out in front of you in a folder or taken from a box. It is immediate and personal, full of discovery that requires close attention. With this in mind, we worked with graphic designer Arabella Kilmartin, who has also designed this book to design a folio of the material so that the visitor could sit down and spend time with it at the table. To make the archive come alive, the folio was placed on a table designed by Magistretti, the round Vidun, with the selections of his chairs and under one of his light fittings, the large iterations of the Sonora pendant. They needed to be in the room and on the floor rather than on a pedestal or wall to be able to speak for themselves. The exhibition was completed by the visitor sitting down at the table. It's the slightest but definitive separation with the exhibition space was made by positioning the objects on Carrara marble. Taking a precious material and allowing one to walk on it is very Italian, whose streets, as we all know, are sometimes marble. With only a small range of objects available, but more than enough, the arrangement was not chronological or themed, but simply from smallest to largest. The sectional progression was reflected in the plan of the marble as a triangle, where the small items were positioned at the pointy end. The triangle was in play with a rectangular room pushing away from the bossy axis of the building by Sean Godsell. The large sonora pendant challenged the high volume of the room, peaked its chubby head up the processional view from the serious lean hallway. In the display window facing the street, Tetti lamps by Magistretti dotted the eyes in the super graphic of Vico Magistretti. Across town, in the elevated large shop front window of the showroom for Euroluce in Exhibition Street, the same size as Sonora and Atollo were positioned side by side with their matching domes aligned at high level from the street. An old couple, one with his feet on the ground and one with her head in the clouds. Deeper in the space, multiple atollo in different sizes animated the dark room in a play of position and reflection. From the book. Mm -hmm. Geometry, simplicity, play can be found in Vico's products. Kuta lamp, it's graphic in its flatness and use of the circular disc diffuser and dome base. Ecclesia, whose light can be hooded, and on the right, Teti is a celebration of the naked light bulb in a curved cone base reminiscent of a candle holder or magist magistrate said an ink pot. The broomstick series derived from anonymous foldable furniture and domestic objects such as clothes and coat stands and obviously the broomstick. And a combination of sticks recalled in Ospite, the sofa bed that folds like a card table and looks like one. Nuvola Rossa is a play of diagonal bracing di uh, dynamically crossing the verticality of the books. Maralunga, where one moves, the head and arm rests in playful combinations. And in the recomposition of Atollo, a series of primary geometric volumes of tube, cone and semi-sphere, whose intersection and shape is revealed through illumination, as if the sole purpose of the lamp was to show us these shapes. Edison, a series of tables that use industrial cast iron tube and joint systems, such as those used by the Edison gas company in Milan. Vidun, 
which in Milanese dialect means large screw, recalls a traditional work table or stool and achieves the dream of having multiple heights so invisibly and simply. Selene, almost a caricature of a chair, but in plastic. Sinbad, my favorite, a horse blanket, but it also feels like a flying carpet with the familiarity of the blanket draped over the sofa. The large dots of mono lamp and pendants. Pascal lamp that doubles the cone of the earlier snow lamp to create a play of light and reflection. Sonora lamp is a semi-sphere or a dome with the subtle use of gold or other more reflective surfaces on the inside of the dome. Snow, whose most pure iteration was probably the pendant, a pure cone. Oh, did we miss one? Um, and Porcena takes the same shape, transformed it in the most simple move in a wall lamp that flips the table lamp upside down. <laughs> and the large exhaust oh. hood, oh, sorry, <laughs> and pan, which needs little explanation in the shape of Peter Pan. And uh, sorry, China, which literally means roof. Chimera is a ribbon like form made possible by the structural integrity of the methacrylate material. Lastly, the blossom table, where the blossom is expressed through the laminations in the leg. This quite Italian position of looking both backwards and forward is an echo played out over and over of the to and fro of let's say modern and traditional that might be just necessary to make breaks and then find our fit again. Thank you. That's the end of our presentation. Enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you.
the forgetting of that forgetting memory of the future. <clears throat> I acknowledge and foreground that I'm here tonight on the unceded land of the Gadigal and Bidjigal peoples of the Eura Nation. I pay respects to the elders past, present and future whose rights to this land continue as strong as ever, despite the malignant settler colonial occupation. <clears throat> Gagajun Man, the 1986 book, co-authored and named after Big Bill Nigi, preeminent Bunich poet, philosopher and leader from the East Alligator River in the Northern Territory. Land where ancestral being Injuwani Juwa, laden with creative enormity, hunted, danced, traveled, carving out the earth, giving form to the land, and at the same time, imparting the wisdom of all this to the Bunich clan. Water flowing, water following his trail, filling up rivers and lagoons. Red lily billabong, where in undid, Red Lily Billabong, where Unju Wanijua transformed himself into a colossal stone and came to rest right in the middle of the water surrounded by pink lotus. This book, Gagoju Man, which was transcribed by anthropologist Stephen Davies, contains the poetry spoken by Naiji. Often mythologized, Remembered as the last speaker of the Gagaju language, Naji entrusted his geopoetic stories to the book's pages. The land itself, a text, it can be read, listened to, felt, but is never reduced simply to human needs. The local ecosystems to varying degrees are artifacts of the relationship between Bunich people and their country. Naji wisdom, intuition, philosophy, law, printed in text to ensure it was not lost. Tree grow, every night he grow, daylight, he stop, just about dark, he start again. Just about morning I look, I say, oh, nice tree this. When you sleep, tree growing like other trees, they got lots of blood. Throughout Nige's poetry and in Aboriginal English generally, E with H dropped does not refer to a male figure. Here, E is an ambiguous gender neutral pronoun, variously referring to tree, person, spirit, feeling, and the story itself. E is swept up. The tree in the story becomes unlimitedly various, but will not budge. A specific tree in print, wandering off the page, unsettling, growing like other trees, full of blood. According to European interpretation, the figure of the tree stands for genealogy, the distinct family unit, excluding everything else in its environment. This is not the tree in Nige's poem. E is open to and contingent on everything in the ecosystem, innumerable worlds. You can only search for your roots through poetry or knowledge. The tree I'm concerned with is a boab standing alone in a car park in Darwin City in the Northern Territory. At first glance, at first glance, a stranger stranded in an asphalt sea, but determined. As though it were inverted, its swollen trunk resembles a bulb, the plant's underground storage organ, and its branches are a mesh of roots planted in the sky, errant tree, its triumph, its triumphant codex growing in every direction casts a singular shadow. This Boab's past mirrors and reflects the enigm enigmatic history of Boab or Baobab trees, in particular, the species' mysterious arrival and existence on this continent. Endemic to the Northern Territory and the Kimberley region of Western Australia, 
it's not known to science or the prevailing historical record how the Boab, native to mainland Africa and Madagascar, arrived here. What's important is what goes beyond the ocean of abyss. African tree, the Baobab, the sacred tree under which elders used to gather to talk, says Edouard Glissant in Mantia Diawara's effervescent film, Edouard Glissant, One World in Relation. He's speaking about despair and loss and what can be gained in the traces of such loss. It's certain that the, ba the Boab arrived by sea, the tree's fruit, the Boab nut floating, an unutterable trace across a hollow ocean. The Boab nut contains edible white pith. Did hands clasp the fugitive nut, opening it, the pith softening in the mouth, silently dissolving against the tongue, words dispersing, lexical terrain receding. Every night he grow, daylight, he stop. The undoubtable mystical presence, its history open only to intuition. Entering into the tree, or the tree entering you, is the path from the side of one story to the next. <clears throat> Enigmatic boxer, a young child carrying some wisdom from his homeland. He was a syncretist of sacred traditions. He came from Queensland, arriving at a Kimberley cattle station on the other side of the continent. Just one of the many stations where Indigenous people were variously interned as labourers at the time. Spirit tricks. Boxer could turn into an emu or any sort of bird. He liked the taste of boab husk. When he was 10 years old, he planted a recalcitrant boab tree on a patch of colonial lawn at the station homestead against the wishes of the white gardener. This was in the 1890s and he named the tree after himself. Boxer boab, bloated trunk, might be full of water, light brown bullet bark that looks wet, shimmering pink star on the river's rippled surface. In the dry season, the bob sheds its oily green leaves and its knotted branches freeze in the light. Bob nuts are good. Eat the husk or mix it with water. Drink it. Carve the shell with images of emu, lizard, snake, kangaroo, turtle even. I came to Darwin in February, in February of this year to do archival and site research towards the production of my first book, looking for a trace of my grandmother's life in an eroding, in an eroding landscape, a history set scarred with the horrors of settler colonialism, but an, but an interpretive path from where fragments of meaning might be recollected and retold I wanted something material, marking her indubitable journey, a six-year-old child taken from her family, thrown on the back of a cattle truck, driven hundreds of kilometres to a mission in Western Australia. Archival records, architecture of cruelty, in the old papers, records, books stored at the Darwin Archive, I found no evidence but a decaying frame for absence. To start with, all one can do is try to name things, one by one, flatly, enumerate them, count them in the most straightforward way possible, in the most precise way possible, trying not to leave anything out. Susan Howe, observing the deceptively simple wording of Emily Dickinson's beautiful elliptical poem, My Life Had Stood a Loaded Gun, writes that 
definition, seeing rather than perceiving, hearing and not understanding is only the shadow of meaning. The Boab, like the poem, remains outside the constraints of a specific resolution, resisting the demand for transparency. Enter into the tree, present it in its opacity. Rotten tree, you got to burn him, use him to cook, he's finished up. Cook or roast in coals, white European cooking oven from university that. <clears throat> the Boab precedes the car park in Darwin. It's not known how it got there. Sometime in the 1880s, it was planted or began growing by itself. A black fella traveling north from the Kimberley might have bought the seeds, soaked them in water, scarified them, planted and helped them grow. The city's first primary school was built around the Boab, its sprawling branches shading children in the schoolyard through the first half of the 20th century. Greek Australian artist Vlase Zanales painted a depiction of a large hollow of Boab with a cell like window in its trunk. Reviewing the artist's exhibition in 1949, a journalist incorrectly described it as a prison tree, a myth that sticks in the public imaginary. It's true. Indigenous people were dragged around the continent in iron shackles by colonial police and bound to trees. The Bible is not a prison. The Bible grows slowly. It's dormant in the dry season. Daylight. He stopped. It's soft yellow flowers opening in September. In World War II, when Darwin was bombed, a Japanese daisy cutter bomb landed by the Boab and came to lay, unexploded in the tree's shade for days. Then, in 1974, when tropical cyclone Tracy tore through Darwin, sculpting steel girders and tearing the built city to the ground, the Boab stood there, facing the sky. The Boab disrupted Charles Darwin University's development plans. The Boab directed the architecture of the abortive new campus, the tree's halation, a commanding radius of air and light space. The university was already cursed because it cut down a hundred year old milkwood and so it ran out of money and has halted the development plans anyway. The Boab isn't rotten, its skin glares, uncertain and irregular boundary of memory, inconsistent memories, traces across the tree's warped surface, snaky, angel, archie, tiger, names carved in bark, personal markers of future memory.
Okay. Um, hello to everyone who is uh, following this. My name is uh, Freek Persijn from the office of uh, called 51M for E in Brussels. Um, I just finished doing the dishes. Now I do a lecture for, I don't know how many people, maybe two, maybe 20, maybe more. Um, when the question came uh, to talk about um, how things, how space can be occupied and what things could be done, that's how, at least how I interpreted it. I thought it would be nice after this moment of lockdown to reflect to something that uh, happened to us uh, two years ago or something that we made ourselves happen to ourselves. Um, so I, I thought in that sense not to talk about the space that we designed, but maybe more a space that we found occupied and activated. Because I think it, um, it's, um, it was a very nice experience and an experience worthwhile sharing. And I explain to you at the end of the talk why I think it's worthwhile sharing. So the place I will talk about is um, the World Trade Center, the North District in uh, Brussels. It's um, very north, just north of the center, uh, an area which in the 60s, 70s has been demolished. Um, thousands of people have been evicted. And uh, in the idea of building a grand master plan with uh, a lot of high rise towers. Um, but from the very beginning, um, the failure of the project and let's say the incapacity to meet those uh, huge ambition, ambitions was very clear. Um, so the, the evictions happened 100%, um, but the rebuild uh, didn't. And so the, the area in Brussels is known for its somehow vacancy. Um, first of all, a very vacant atmosphere because it's a monofunctional district. And the moment that we um, decided to engage ourselves with it was also a moment of uh, real vacancy, where real vacancy of the offices of the, of the building started. So um, buildings that were at the end of their lease of life and looking for a revamp. We, um, got interested in this area um, years before. This is an image of 2011 um, of a study that we did for the future of Brussels, where we thought that it would be very interesting to take these um, huge buildings, because they're quite huge, at least for Brussels scale, and to somehow program them differently, to program them in a way as part of the city, and to somehow keep their big scale as a quality, but to open up the programming and open up the use. And this is what we tried um, as a first test in February 2017. Uh, me being a, a teacher back then for the University of Hassels, um, moving in a two week workshop uh, on the, I think it was the 19th floor of the World Trade Center, um, doing a masterclass, but also a public discussion, a lecture series public discussion on what the future of these towers could be. And so spending two weeks um, somehow showed a lot of quality of that place, qualities that were in the public debate totally dismissed, not acknowledged. So being on site has been for two weeks a tremendous precious pressure cooker. And we also um, got to know a few people amongst them the owner of the building and there we decided with the office. Back then it was 40 people. Now we are 50, but back then it was a bit smaller, but still quite a lot of people. We somehow negotiated to move in. Um, that happened in um, August 2017. So let's say five months later. So we occupied the 16th floor. Um, but we didn't just do it. Uh, by ourselves. We somehow saw it as a coalition that we could set up and also as a kind of demonstration of how these empty buildings could be used differently. Um, so it was, it became our home for about a year and a half. Um, and we, we really tested and tried out uh, a lot of things. Um, so in a way you could say we shifted our role from being an architect to being an activist looking at the space available, uh, occupying it, 
and um, by this occupation to build links and to build uh, alliances. So in the beginning, it was architecture work from Brussels, um, 51 and 4E and Vraiment Vraiment, and together with Up for North, which was an, which is a kind of small organization that the main owners um, of the North District have set up to rethink a vision for the North District. And so our contribution was to turn this vision into a practical test of um, involving also policymakers, involving also universities to um, think how the North District could become more um, diverse and more active. Um, so what do we mean with that? Um, so what is the test that we wanted to try? So we tested new forms of working and attracting new types of users, because um, now it's a bit of a victim of a nine to five um, and also a very administrative um, um, use of, the, of that area. And so uh, our year and a half of testing was to test how this could also be a place for education and universities, for startups, for, but also for public activities, collective activities, shared activities, that somehow used the space, even if no one really considered it a space that could be anything else but office. And so Lab North was a kind of temporary um, association, uh, like a collaboration between uh, the four that I just mentioned, to really do something on site and to occupy it. And by this occupation, give only um, give not only kind of new ideas, but also to give uh, a new sense of trust and a new sense of, uh, and a new experience. So this was in a way the, the, the goal to, to demonstrate that this area could also be an area for smaller um, activities for, um, let's say, co-working places. And um, Lab North in a year and a half time delivered um, so the co-working space for instance was a huge success um, we somehow were able to activate 8,000 square meters in the building we had 33 organizations in the building we had thousand meters of common space there were workshops um, all of these big companies that were in the area uh, the administration were using our spaces because they were more somehow they felt more free they, they felt more creative in them um, and so um, it, it became literally a kind of a pressure cooker for testing in life um, what kind of different activities you could, uh, you could try and how you could not just, um, how, how you shouldn't re really think from another vision uh, for the future, but almost from a different use of the space that is already there. And the image that you see here is an example of what one of the occupants in the building um, Pool is cool, um, organized. So they took the central fountain, which was a roundabout, and turned it into a swimming pool for two days. And this was also this is also a good example of the kind of um, deal that we made with all the people that came into the building. So they could uh, use the building for a very uh, low amount of uh, rent and also low cost, but in return, they had to invent a project for the North District. And so we somehow ended up with a multiplication of different projects, different points of view. So a kind of incremental um, design by action, intervention driven. During that process, we also became uh, the architect because there was a competition organized to our surprise. We didn't know in the beginning. Uh, we won it also because in uh, six months time we had developed a sensibility and we were somehow already a challenger <clears throat> with the 40 person office on that market. We teamed up uh, with um, more um, a bigger commercial firm from Brussels and one of the things that I think really managed to create a breakthrough in the whole process of designing that building was to occupy the building with the owner, his engineers, his team, his real estate agents as well. So the, the owner of the building became somehow part of this um, temporary occupation and came there every week, left their offices, which are more in the outskirts of Brussels in a rather posh area of Brussels 
and we're working and living on site every week on uh, Tuesday and Thursday, if I remember well. Um, so also for them to change their habits and to change uh, their expectations and to witness the building uh, in real, but also to witness the ground floor, for instance, the building in real. So somehow the, the discussions that we were trying to raise became very tangible for this group of people, um, which at some points were 90 people in one single day passing in the project at the gate. I will not explain the building, but here you have um, maybe two links that you can um, access um, to talk about this notion of metropolitan hybrids, these large scale buildings that we think have a huge potential to be rethought uh, without demolishing them. And also the project of World Trade Center, the ZIN project, as its new name is, you can uh, visit on our site through this, through this link. We also became an exhibition designer during that period. So designing how the 23rd floor, which was a floor which was the innovation platform, uh, a space that was both exhibition but also co-working space, a space where a lot of workshops uh, were held and which was offering a unique uh, view on the city, um, and which also became like intimately public uh, for um, during the summer of 2017. Um, and also where the different things that we tried somehow organically coincided. So this is a mock-up uh, that we did for the refurbishment of the building, which became part of the exhibition. So the test of opening a window, feeling the air coming in. So really not only thinking about the future, but also changing how you can haptically perceive and uh, experience the area and the building differently. And one of the initiatives that some people in the office launched themselves was to become an urban gardener. Um, so this used to be imagined as the public space of the future North District. The third floor uh, used, was imagined as a kind of continuous deck between uh, different buildings, a deck that was never connected. The bridges that would connect these decks were never built. But the expanse of space is quite remarkable, um, has been empty for 40 years, 50 years. And so that, that was one of the tests to see what the quality of these spaces could be. Uh, also, over the course of a few months, um, like naive, but also very uh, exhilarating um, to do urban gardening on the roof and to witness the quality of that space and somehow see the emptiness of that area in a totally different light. So over the course of a, a year and a half, we have performed the role of a teacher, of a temporary occupant, an activist, an architect, an exhibition designer, an urban gardener. And uh, during the last months, it struck me how the power of this has, is so difficult in digital times because you're somehow stuck in your house, stuck in your role, especially. And I think this is the thing that we as an office really want to uh, um, pr promote and stand for is to um, be in a position to be able to listen and to be able to care and to not stick to a predefined um, definition of what the question should be, but really think on all of these people that are necessary and are important to um, rethink areas, um, to have them meet. Um, and so we are really believing very strongly in the in the power of doing things, even if they're very simple, and also in the, in the power of um, changing your role and changing your perspective. And we think it can really help you absorb a lot of um, things that are minute, which are very small, um, which seem unimportant on first sight, but have a great deal of impact. So how people perceive space, what their practical concerns are, how they perceive things differently, and so the strategic ambiguity is something that uh, now the lockdown is lifted that we hope to activate very soon again. So this is the idea that I wanted to share uh, on how space can be occupied and how things could be done. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and maybe we will get in touch someday soon.
Good evening. I would like to thank you for having invited me to this talk. I will talk in the next 15 minutes about the theme of space. First of all, I would like to show you a drawing we did for a magazine in the last year. It can be understood as a short introduction or also context to our work and our thinking about space and living. The task was about exploring our own take on the, topping of on the topic of identity and to design a dwelling using only elements and rooms from previously existing projects from our self-defined context. Our interest was to put together spaces that not only have an architectural quality through their form and spatial design, but also in a social vision on how we live today. The current era, also called the Anthropocene, is characterized by radical change. Technical and scientific, scientific achievements are changing the world faster than ever before. Despite these radical changes, we think or hope that the architecture can be something continuous, integrated into its long history. Well-designed spaces retain their validity over centuries. A room in a Palladian villa touches us 400 years after its creation, also life today is very different. This is achieved through the intelligent use of architectural elements to compose a space with beautiful proportions and materials. This is one way of how architecture can be culturally sustainable and create identity. The size of our site corresponds to a typical plot for, for a freestanding eight to 10 apartment house in the inner city of Zurich. Most of the selected references deal in a very specific way with the basic elements of, of a room like walls, floors, ceilings and columns. The center of our new dwelling is Palladio Sala of the Villa Gornaro with the four freestanding columns in each corner of the room. Other rooms are arranged around it like satellites. The dining room of Schinkelsfeilen residence in Berlin is placed adjoining to the sala. It is a room intended for preparing food or vessels from the garden, but it can also be used as a meeting room. Attached to the dining room is the chimney room of Adolf Loh's private apartment. A continuous axis connects the kitchen with the sala and the portico and the garden. In this axis, the large stone table from the Villa Lante is placed, which is dining table and fountain in the same time. The garden pavilion, which is based on the primitive hut of Marc-Antoine Logier, forms the end of this axis. This project is important for us because it is a start in the theory of architecture to think about the elements that create the Ur space. The winter garden of the Villa Tugendhat by Mies van der Rohe makes it possible to overwinter the plants from the garden. It acts as a threshold space between inside and outside. And the Warhol's silver factory directly adjacent to the residential building is a symbol of a space that allows multiple use. It embodies the idea of an open space, workspace, a place where ideas and other things can emerge. A fragment of Hermann Czech's Kleines Café is built next to this large open space, an intimate, small-scaled public room. In the garden, there is the tent room of Karl Friedrich Schinkel as a demarcation of the vegetable garden. It serves as a place of retreat, the tent as an image of temporary dwelling of mobility, but there depicted in a built, fixed and immobile form, a space as an expression of a lifestyle. The entire spatial conglomerate is conceived at the same time as a living and working space with common rooms on the ground floor and private rooms on the upper floor. This is an overview of the collections of the different rooms. So you can see again the uh, Palladio's Villa Gornaro, the Schinkel's um, dining room, uh, the chimney room of Adolf Loos, the tent room, again from Schinkel, Mies Wintergarten and um, Czech's Kleines Café and the Warhol Silver Factory and the reconstruction of the primitive hut of Marc-Antoine Logier. Breaking up the small private housing unit into a large residential building with more public spaces and small retreats 
creates the possibility of a new way of living together. This new building type creates the possibility of living together in a way that works beyond the traditional image of domestic cohabitation and which allows to create new forms of neighborhood organizations. Sharing, complementing and helping each other out, living together and yet having the possibility to, li to live in, a privacy, in privacy is a theme of this new housing type. And last but not least, and maybe this is also a way to live more sustainable and ecological. Our collage formulates the vision of a living form which combines the characteristics of a private villa with those of public spaces. The autonomy and determination of a villa merged with the openness or generic qualities of a silver factory. The chosen spaces offer the possibility of multiple use without losing their strong atmosphere and identity. That's what our interest in architecture is. How can a space be formed, assembled or constructed by the basic elements to create a specific atmosphere in addition to their use? Hubertus Temporary is a project in Albisreden, that a district in the outskirts from Zurich, but still quite close to the city centre. It is a project just around the corner from our office. The project started due to the fact that there were no possibilities to meet in the neighbourhood over lunch or in the evening, to eat, drink or simply to have a talk or discussion with friends and colleagues. In 2009, the Hubertus and Old Restaurant was closed and together with friends we took the chance to occupy and re riff this place and founded the association Hubertus Temporary. Temporary because it was clear from the beginning that we were only allowed to use the room for a certain time until the, ho until the whole house was renovated. Similar to the food project in Soho, New York, in the early 1970s, where a restaurant was founded by a group of artists, including Gordon Mother Clark, to cook, talk and eat together. With a lot of own work and initiative, this project was started and kept alive for three years, without financial or business intentions. Similar to the food project, the Hubertus was rebuilt for the new use of the Association of Hubertus Temporary with little intervention and a lot of work on our own. The timber cladding of the ceiling was painted black to frame the old original wood panelings on the walls. The panelling remained as the central defining element of the, of the restaurant and the space. Wooden tables and colourful chairs from different eras characterised the interior. At the opening, every guest was asked to bring a chair with him. It was intended to be a large living room, which invites one to stay in a homely, informal atmosphere. Hubertus Temporary was a project that went beyond architecture. It was a place that was not only designed by us, but where we were actively involved in the programming of the place and to look after its day-to-day -day business. And where a wide network and exchange with other people took place. What the Hubertus project show is our interest in the further thinking of existing structures. This seems to us a fundamental and sustainable task in architecture. When doing an intervention in an existing structure, the most important is to first understand what is already there and to develop an idea of space, an entire building or a piece of a city with a precise intervention. It is always about the dialectic between conserving and changing. But how can we do the transformations? New spaces can be created from or with the basic elements of architecture, but old ones can also be extended and rearranged with them. Basic elements are the walls, the ceilings, the floors and columns. The elements that are part of the discussion around the primitive hut and the ur space that I mentioned before with Marc and Juan Logier. Our projects are about the composition of the individual elements and their interaction in space and finally how they form a space. The constructive elements become more than just a functional element. Their composition, dimension and materiality characterize and form the space and its atmosphere, as I will show now here in the Happy House. It is about the left half of the double single family house in Zurich in an earlier transformation. This had been divided into two apartments, 
one on the ground floor and one on the two upper floors. The task was to create a new living unit in the whole house. There was not much left of the original state and atmosphere of the house due to these modifications. Besides the living room with the ceiling stucco and the wood panelings on the walls. This room therefore served as a ur space for us to determine the strategy for the reconstruction of the house. All rooms should receive again a specific atmosphere and the house would get back its own character. The colored dots in the plans are the ceiling mural, which we have newly introduced into the house, inspired by the ceiling stucco of the ur space. That's the ur space. These are the new ceiling mirrors. The entrance hall gets a red circular ceiling mirror. Cement tiles have been laid diagonally on the floor in the entrance hall and kitchen. The fishbone parquet has been added according to the existing parquet. In the dining room, there is a noble green ceiling with reference to the garden. The color um, the color of the mirror, of the ceiling mirror, connects with the color of the kitchen floor uh, that is uh, diagonally laid out. And uh, this diagonally um, layout of the kitchen floor connects also with the parquet of the dining room. On the upper floor, the library, room, the library room was connected to the spatial enfilade of the ground floor by enlarging the opening of with a double-winged almost room high door. The master bedroom was also connected to this enfilade with a dark blue, <clears throat> with a midnight blue ceiling mirror, as you can see here in the image. The library is characterized by the black ceiling mirror the black marble chimney and the lacquered doors. The colored sequence of ceiling mirrors reveals a new spatial sequence inside. The floor patterns of the parquet and the floor tiles together with the colors and shapes of the ceiling mirrors become a new connecting element of the house. In this drawing, the floor plan, the ceiling mirror and the sectional view were assembled together to form a picture that explains the relationship between the elements, wall, floor, and ceiling. So the section with the perspective view in the middle is um, uh, around them. Uh, there are the floor plans and the ceiling mirrors. These drawings we normally do after the project is built or the competition is over. It is about bringing all the principal ideas and the responses that now already exist into a drawing that represents a resolution. In our practice, the production of these drawings gives us a way to think and talk about our own work. The drawing are something between a sketch, a photograph, a model and a plan. This project was to extend an existing apartment house to create contemporary family apartments. The concept is based on the idea of the nine square floor plan. The existing building with the six chamber floor plan is extended with an addition that contains three rooms, the kitchen, the living room and the loggia. The new middle part of the existing house, the inner hall is opened up to the extension, and the new sequence of spaces and the new sequence of spaces are structured by pillars. The new unhydrated uh, floor and the pillars become the connecting element of old and new, and the element that, ca that characterizes the new living room. This is the finished situation of the hall looking towards the extension, the pillars that are forming the different chambers. The color field in the, marks the center of the, uh, of the apartment, but it also connects, connects visually with the uh, concrete ceiling of the extension. As the floor, the anhydrite floor connects uh, this, uh, the connects old and new. 
As a last project, I would like to show you the Mühlezelk Straße. It is also an apartment building that was completely renovated and extended with two bay windows. A garden room with balconies uh, in the southeast and a small bay window in the northwest. The appearance of the bay windows are connected with the big trees that are surrounded, that are um, standing around the house. The branches relate to the wood, wooden structure of the facade. The bay windows allow to connect the existing introverted chamber-like floor plan to the garden. The spatial extensions allow to keep the basic structure of the house but open up to the surroundings. The garden room is attached as a third element to the living room and the kitchen. A new gravity center is created between the three rooms which are now connected by a new wall openings. We place this round pillar in the this, in this center which connects and separates the three new living spaces in the same time. The round pillar functions here as a space structuring and space connecting element. In such drawings, we tested the materiality and the combination of the elements of the column, means the capital and the column shaft. As a structural element, the pillar links the three rooms together. The floor surface of cement tiles in the bay, the existing terracotta in the kitchen and the existing fishbone parquet in the living room are separated by the concrete filling where the walls was broken out. The garden room with its opening is a hybrid room. It can be opened to the outside area or be used as a fully heated inside space. This is the view back into the apartment where you can see living room, kitchen, and in the back you see the bay window towards the street. This bay window is much more introverted through the um, balustrade. It makes it to a much more intimate space. Maybe as a last word, I would like to say that we really love the idea that architecture is here to design, think and protect the whole visible space. Starting from the immense natural space down to the smallest space of the cell of the furniture with all its different questions and problems. Oswald Matthias Umers beautifully summarizes the relationship between the exterior and the interior space in his text from 1985, Seven Variations of Space and the Seven Lamps of Architecture by John Ruskin. I quote, in fact, the real sense of architecture is the double acting of inside and outside of body and space of enclosed and enclosing elements. It lies in what Circle called the genus phase of architecture. Square and street are the result of the surrounding structures, as well as the walls and the columns that determine the space inside. Thank you.
Okay, so should I introduce myself or you guys will do? Okay, so, so it's my turn. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is Gong uh, speaking from Beijing. Uh, today, the title is Real or Unreal? It's actually a question. It's a question for myself. Obviously, we're living a very complicated, um, uncertain moment. The way we see things, the way we interpret things, the way we live together with things is actually substantially challenged by the drastic development of the new technologies, including the digital computation, the internet, and so forth. Uh, seems like there is a parallel virtual world is invading us, is invading our physical world little by little, surrounded by all such this kind of new information, new technologies, and even this kind of illusions. Uh, is there a way that we can stay sober to be able to see through it and eventually to make the judgment about what is real and what is unreal or what is meaningful, what is meaningless? Well. I don't have an answer for that question. Uh, this issue could be also reflected back to the architecture field as well. Uh, is there any meaning of the physical space for today's life? This is also, for me, a very important question too. Or maybe eventually this physical space will be replaced by something else. I don't have an answer either. But to be honest, as an architect, I'm quite struggling for the issue. I'm anxious too. So today I'm going to share a story. It's actually uh, one of our projects finished five years ago. It's a seashore library, uh, which somehow is relevant to the issue I'm addressing today. So now we're going to the to the project. And this picture actually is the library on the right part. It's the library. And the first picture will show you a bird's eye view of an uh, image taken about seven years ago before the project. And you, this is the residential compound. This is the boundary of the property line. And this library is initially built for the people living in the compound in this residential development compound. But eventually this library is open to the public. At the same angle of the view, you can see the next image. This is taken about four years later. So you see much of the area, but this is the previous, and that's after. So much of the area during four years has been largely occupied by this artificial residential development. And I can tell you this is a very typical condition in China in the recent 15 years and 20 years through this drastic urbanization process. And this right spot here is location of the library. That's the first day I was on the site. It's an overcast day. And you can see the image is still very raw, very primitive. And I, I stand on the seashore facing the vast oceanscape. And this is a picture I took the same day. It's a very small fishing hub for the local villagers, but it's already demolished. But this very small structure actually gave us a very strong inspiration of the project, especially when we step into the space. And you can see this dark, small, squeezed space and you see through these windows almost like a hand painting on the wall and then uh, in the distance is the is the ocean this actually made me think of uh, a very famous japanese artist his name is hirashi sujimoto i guess maybe some of you guys know this know him he, he had this very famous series of 
photographs just focusing on the ocean horizon. This is very simple geometry, but through the different weather, different time, different location, you see how dramatic the difference is. And actually our library is facing this drama created by the ocean. We started project with a sectional study. This is a typical way uh, we started uh, architecture design. And uh, this is even before we have a specific idea, just a very kind of, uh, how to say, uh, a study of how the potential, how the air and the light can come into the space. And little by little, we have more specific ideas of this particular project. Eventually, it actually consists of uh, several layers of different spatial contour lines. This is also a section sketch. And together, they made this entire overall experience uh, in this architecture. Another important sketch in the schematic phase is showing you uh, we study how the air and the light come into the space and come through the space. This is a model of the project displayed two years ago in the Venice Biennale. This model is actually quite interesting. It's an interactive model and you can literally move each part of the, the sectional uh, component of the architecture and explore what is going on inside the space. And eventually the building is completed. And this picture was taken five years ago, right after the completion of the construction. And you see how vast emptiness the building is surrounded. But now it's very different. The foreground of the picture is already occupied by other buildings. That's the picture of today. So you see the difference. And we designed this building as well. This is a small restaurant right behind the library. I won't spend too much time on explaining the architecture design. I will leave some time for the later story. So I will give you a very quick walkthrough about a, a series of images showing an overall feeling of the architecture and the space. Some penetrations. Transparency. We have this a roll of pivot door on the first floor. So when the weather allows, the door could be rotated to the open state so the air can go through without any block of the architecture uh, boundary. That's the twilight condition. This is a shot from the entrance. So you before you enter, you see through the building and then you notice that there is something actually beyond the architecture space. This is the major reading room of the library. And you see the stepping flooring actually is the basic uh, contour of the interior space. And then the curved directional sailing facing the ocean. And you see this, a series of cutting holes on the ceiling. It's actually the wind tunnel because we have an electronically controlled skylight on top of it. So when it's a summer, when it's a good weather, the air can go through the building by this wind tunnel. But because it actually has an angle towards to the sun, so in the afternoon, when the sun angle parallels to the tunnel, there will be direct sunlight casted on the floor as a circular shadow. And you can literally feel the shadow is moving because the tunnel has a lens, so it becomes very sensitive to the light and the time. Corner window. And we have a small uh, meditation space alongside the big reading room. We have uh, some very small cutting holes on the wall between these two spaces, so you have the opportunity to see through and to look back into the reading room. It's a more pressed, more uh, personal space for meditation. We actually use the wood framework to cast the concrete. So you see the texture, the grain on the surface of the wall, especially when the light is parallel. 
there's another uh, outdoor terrace on the floor, uh, on the, sorry, on the roof. And in this space, you won't be able to see the, the ocean because it's a concave curve, but you will listen to the, the sound of the wave as the outdoor deck separates the reading room with the activity room. And that's the activity room. We have two skylights in this particular room. One is facing to the west, another is facing to the east. So at some certain moment of the day, you will, at the same moment, you will see through a different color tones of the light because the, the direct sunlight from the west will be a warmer tone, but the east light is actually reflected by the sky, it's bluish some twilight condition. And that's an overall view of the, of the architecture. So the building is built, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, something very interesting happened after this. The library opened in 2015, April, so which is about uh, five years ago. Right after the opening of the project, uh, in China, we have a very famous uh, internet platform called Yitiao means uh, one piece per day is the name of the platform. And they actually shoot a very short film of the project and they post it online. And all of a sudden, this project become a touristy destination of the people all around the country. They fly from different cities just to see this small building and they take pictures without necessarily reading inside the space, and then they leave. And so far, you see there is a very interesting number here. There has been 500 million people already viewed this film. So, you know, we have a large population in China. This is the, some of the shots, some of the shots taken at that period of time. Uh, the, entire library, we designed 75 sits, but at that month, a couple of months, there was about 2,000 or 3,000 people per day to go there to visit the library. So the space is fully packed and it's, it's no longer a library, it's becoming a, a train station almost. And that, but soon after, the client apply online reservation system to control the number of the people. So right now it's in a normal condition. And that's the regular condition of the library. I collected some of the, the pictures from regular people and to let you to have a feeling that how the space has been used. I guess this is the students from the neighborhood and the kids writing homework maybe. And there's people sitting along the bench reading the book. And families with kids, and elderly people with kids, children playing inside the space, and they find their own corners. Sleeping figures, construction workers, because there's still some construction going on around the site. So once in a while, you will see these kind of people and very trendy girls, friends, lovers, I guess. All those celebrities are shooting advertisement, commercial. And this guy is a famous guy. This is my idol. His name is Tri Jian. He's a rock star in China. I listened to his music when I was a high school student. And uh, models, actresses, magazines, shooting covers. This guy is uh, also a famous Japanese designer, uh, Ken Yahara. He visits the building too. Very strange figures shooting. Avant-garde artist, I guess. A lot of symposiums, uh, panel discussions, lectures, class has been taken place uh, inside the space. 
I guess this is a lecture for lifestyle, tea, music, fashion. And they even use the space as the dancing class floor. So can we imagine this is the library? So this is amazing. Parties in front of the building, fashion show. They use the front part as the fashion walkway. And then they use the interior space as the changing and the making up space. Tourists, students taking their graduation shots, concerts. It's very coincident because the floor has a stepping. So it's, it actually meets the requirement of a, of a theater. So the, the floor become the stand, the audience uh, stand. Different concerts, cello players, uh, some singers from the minority people, the poet, the reading uh, party, sharing their uh, poem. And this guy is from America. He's a very famous uh, jazz player, Ron Cutter. He actually has his own concert two years ago in the library. Well, this is the last image uh, of today's uh, talk. On the left part, it's actually the fourth anniversary poster uh, done by the local management team. They collected some of the paintings and the sketches by the regular visitors, users, residents, and most of them are kids. So you can feel how people like this space. And, but for me, this is a very unique experience uh, as an architect to see such a very small space, a small scale architecture has been generating such a magnitude of the social energy, the social engagement. And the way this building has been utilized is way beyond the architect's definition. So it really makes me still believe that the architecture space, the authentic architecture space, it's still necessary and a very powerful medium to connect things, to connect the people with people, the people with society, and the people with nature. And I think that's probably the meaning of why we still need authentic physical space. Thank you very much. That's it.
Wenn man läuft, ne? Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, I'm Alex Ely, Director of May. Uh, May, we're interested in the parallels between how we design our city and our home. And we live in challenging times, and this is my manifesto of how our cities and homes need to respond to some of the challenges we face. It's called a manifesto for better living. Chapter one is uh, called Resilient Cities, and it explores how, by responding to culture, working with existing fabric, and considering an intensity of use, we can design in resilience. And my journey starts in the 14th century with the allegory of good and bad government painted by An Ambrogio Lorenzetti. It represents an idea of civic society. It depicts an international city, an urban hub filled with traders and merchants. The citizens act as symbol symbolic representations of the various civic officers. Lorenzetti expresses the idea that the cause of peace lays not only from the effects of good government, but also from its citizens. If we roll forward to the 16th century and this painting of the ideal city attributed to Luciana Lorana, it presents a highly composed and architecturally designed series of buildings that frame a public space. But it's in marked contrast to Lorenzetti's painting as it shows a public space devoid of people, it wishes to avoid being contaminated by the workaday city. It represents what Jane Jacobs might describe as orthodox urbanism or elaborately learned superstition. It avoids the everyday. So my first principle is that we need to profit from a sense of place, responding to the people and culture that we find. Cities evolve around memories, and traces and patterns of life. In order to create places that promote equity and are inclusive, we need to accommodate and celebrate their diversity and the diversity of the people who live there. If we think back to times past, too often architects have sought to ignore history, to demolish buildings and start again, reflecting a desire for a fresh start. And the thinking was epitomized by Le Corbusier in his blueprint for an ideal city. Today, we are more aware of the social impact this approach can have uh, when it is not wanted and of the environmental waste of resource. And in the UK, more than 50,000 buildings every year are demolished. And while 90% of that uh, material from that demolition is recovered, much of it is recycled into less valuable product rather than being reused. So my second principle is make, do and mend. Let's reuse existing fabric, recycle, upcycle, whatever you like to call it. Let's retrofit first before looking to replace. A principle we explored in our Hillington Square is, uh, um, estate refurbishment uh, was this idea of make, do and mend, where we gave the estate a second life. We achieved this through considered interventions, and improvements to the fabric of the building, thereby improving the homes and extending their life. And through selective demolitions to improve connections and accessibility. We also need to consider the social infrastructure needed to make successful places. Our neighborhoods need to be social with stimulating spaces that drive value and opportunity for all. We need easy access to facilities, to places of leisure, places of employment. So my next principle is don't be intense, or don't be dense rather, but be intense. And our proposal for an urban renewal scheme in Westminster in London aims to drive intensity through proximity of uses. It's something we desperately missed in our current pandemic driven lockdown. This drawing aims to illustrate, illustrate the rich mix of elements in this scheme. It has enhanced public realm and streetscape and an improved space for the local market. It introduces a new civic space, which the neighborhood currently lacks. It brings together places for new enterprise and maker spaces 
alongside spaces for learning and for families. And it balances its urbanity with softer landscape spaces for leisure, for the benefit of the thousand homes that will form part of this proposal. Of course, every place has a history and we can work with that history to create places that belong. Chapter two moves on to the neighborhood, from the neighborhood to the buildings that make up that neighborhood, as well as, explore, as exploring the spaces in between those buildings. It starts with the need for narratives and storytelling as a way to build on collective memory. For our project for a community center at Sands End in Lambeth, or in South London rather, uh, the site, a park, uh, was where James Herbert Vetch a distinguished horticulturalist in the late 19th century, founded his nursery, importing for the first time orchids and exotic plants to the UK. The form of the building seen here on the right echoes those horticultural glasshouses that historically occupied the site. The complex of buildings are loosely clustered together to form a series of indoor and outdoor rooms that transition from the street to the park. One-off buildings uh, like this obviously uh, add richness to the social infrastructure of the city, but large neighborhoods are also made up of quieter buildings that form the background of our cities. London neighborhoods are characterized by Edwardian mansion blocks, Georgian terraces, Victorian semi-detached houses. So my next principle of, is about mixing and matching in order to create a varied urban grain. James Gibbs was one of the most influential British architects of the early 18th century. And in 1728, he published a book of architecture containing designs of buildings and ornaments, a folio with drawings of his buildings containing over 380 designs. It was intended as a pattern book for both architects and clients. It became, according to John Summerson, probably the most widely used architecture book of the century not only throughout Britain, but in America and the West Indies. He was the first architect to publish a book devoted to his own designs. And my point being is that we should exploit successful models. So in our large projects, we look to take uh, references from successful types, working with familiar models, but gradually evolving them for our time. It's an idea we explored at Graham Park. Alongside a mixed use local center, we created a neighborhood made up of familiar residential types. Mansion blocks seen here on the top left line the edge of a park. Villas illustrated in the top middle sit in the woodland and terraces on the top right form streets and vary the scale and the grain of the place. Of course, good urban design is, and importantly, about the spaces between the buildings as much as the buildings themselves. Uh, buildings and public spaces need to work hand in hand. Buildings need to free the spaces in between, not constrain them. We can look at Camilo Cito's book, City Planning According to Artistic Principles, which is richly illustrated with sketches and neighborhood maps. Cité draws parallels between the elements of public space and those of furnished rooms. And he made a forceful case that the aesthetic experience of urban spaces should be the leading factor of urban planning. Our scheme, Brentford Lock, celebrates shared streets where pedestrians are prioritized over cars, communal gardens that sit in the center of the scheme, and collegiate spaces that act as thresholds between the public and the private realm. So here on the left, we see the shared resident garden, which sits in the middle of a block and is accessible for all. And on the right, the entrance lobby to the apartment, not only a transition space, but a shared space and a sheltered space for communal gatherings. If we move on to some of the specifics in relation to the buildings that make up our cities, how do we address pressing issues such as climate and biodiversity emergency? How do we build for the future? Debris from construction, demolition and industrial processes is one of the biggest waste streams in the world. And our goal has to be create, to create a circular world 
where waste is synonymous with raw material. And we're a long way off this, but in our Sansem project that I referenced earlier, we're starting. And working with a company Stone Cycling, we've been using bricks made from waste. So 60% of their mass is made from upcycled waste material. And alongside this, the building uses solid timber construction, and this enables us to build a building with a reduced carbon footprint due to the material and the processes employed. Which brings me to the notion that we need to do more with less, using less resource and consuming less carbon. Last year's intergovernmental panel on climate change reported that the world has little over a decade to radically reduce carbon emissions in order to avoid catastrophe. Yet construction remains skewed towards energy intensive buildings. Agar Grove is a large scheme of 500 homes that we're designing to passive house standards. It's currently under construction and aims to reduce the long-term carbon in use through a fabric first approach. Working with Hawkins Brown Architects and Camden Council, it'll be the largest passive house scheme in the UK and will set a new benchmark for public housing. But buildings then need to also contribute to civic culture. And my next chapter promotes and encourages civic culture in architecture. In his book, One Way Street, Walter Benjamin describes this, the idea of the city and of architecture as being animated and activated by the businesses and activities of its occupants and of space as inert without people and culture. Like Benjamin, we are interested in spatiality, which invites occupation, which facilitates a reciprocal relationship between people and space, between culture and architecture. The principle is explored in our scheme at Robert Street. Here, deep facades are responsive to climate. They offer solar shade, as well as giving grandeur to the building, and they create generous outdoor amenity. And the walkways to the apartments on the left, illustrated here on the left, are wide enough for residents to put plants and personal effects on and convene and communicate with neighbours. The final chapter of my manifesto looks at the quality of the home itself. As Confucius said, the strength of a nation derives from the integrity of the home. Neighbourhood needs to accommodate a diverse mix of housing to meet our changing needs and demographic shifts, particularly the increase in people living alone or a desire for multi-generational housing. To get that mix right, we truly need to understand the people we are designing for. And that involves intensive engagement, listening, and allowing residents to be heard. And it's something we enact on all our projects, really trying to get it into the skin of the people and the place that we're designing in. And in terms of mix of particular interest to us is how we design for our needs later in life. Demographically, the proportion of our retirement age population is growing. Compelling evidence from analysis on mortality risks shows that communities with strong social relationships are likely to remain alive longer than similar individuals with poor social relationships. So in our, in our summer Leighton scheme here, we considered how an apartment building designed for residents in their later life could accommodate spaces for connection, for gathering. So each group of eight apartments shares this double story winter garden uh, where they can meet, play chess, read the paper, have a drink in the evening. And that's of course alongside more communal spaces for the uh, entire group of residents and their neighbors on the ground floor. And so finally, we move into the home itself and consider the room as a space to create delight. And returning to our Brentford lock scheme, I'm reminded of architect Eric Lyons quote when he said, it's not how easy it is to build a home that matters, but how easy it is to live in. And in this case, generous loggia balconies provide an outdoor room as an extension to the apartment. And internally, flats are designed for dual aspect, for good quality of light, and for spatial interest. And our goal is always to create layouts aimed at improving people's quality of life. 
And this brings me full circle. We started from the city looking into a room and we now look back out to the city uh, from the home. So my final image illustrates views from the private realm of a domestic space out to the city and to our collective and shared spaces. It looks at parallels between spatial qualities of room and public spaces, between the way we connect rooms and the way we connect a city. It's where I'll finish my talk, looking back from the room to the city. Thank you.
right. Okay, I just try to minimize your screen. Okay. So here we are. So from Brussels, uh, I'm Kirsten. Uh, together with David, uh, we are office. And it's an interesting question to, or at least it's worthwhile to wonder where we are now here uh, in the middle of confinement. And perhaps we are not, at this moment, at least in Brussels, we are not in its deepest point, but still. Um, after three months, uh, first at home and a little bit in the office in our small bubble, um, what to think about rooms, perimeters, containers. So this is perhaps our room, our perimeter, our container, so it's the office. Um, well, I guess the office is in many ways where we are, how we are, and the mess we make. And of course, I do not think our approach to mess and life has changed in the last couple of months, perhaps on the contrary. Um, in many respects, uh, we are dealing with a situation which is the most extreme, I guess, I've ever lived, and perhaps also the most evident, the most banal, the most boring, the most self-confirming. So here you are, you see a little picture I took um, of another picture of us, for instance, somewhere uh, in the Nile Delta, a wall, a tree, it somehow looks as if the tree, the palm tree is in the wall, but in fact, it's outside of that wall. And I believe in many ways, that's where we also are. I mean, we are all trying to readdress um, our own bubble, our own world in relationship to the world outside. And I've been traveling quite a bit of time in the last three years. I think we have been dealing with items of responsibility. I think Thunberg's call was very important. We have been dealing with items of political engagement. We have been dealing with items of sharing of civic life. And all of a sudden there's this gap and we can think, we can reflect if there where we are in that wall, perhaps protected, um, perhaps in a very reduced version of the world, if that makes us very happy. So of course for our office, this wall has been very much there. I mean, at the very beginning, you see here a picture of um, this very famous uh, woodcut of Kircher, of Eden. And quite many times we use it as a reference. And then again this morning, I asked somebody to print it from our reference library. Uh, and I took also a picture of it. Um, and it was important, I believe, to, to be reminded that ultimately um, this, uh, this perimeter with the world inside and this perhaps, this perimeter, another picture of us with the world outside is still very much the place of negotiation. And perhaps more than ever, it's, it's fundamental, more than ever, it's necessary. I believe today very much like I was believing it, like David was believing it, like we were absolutely convinced that architecture has an important role to play in all this ambiguity, in how it deals with inside and outside, how it deals with these problems of hierarchy and how it understands the actual core business, if I could use that word, as a cultural business and the way it negotiates this idea of space. So here you have another picture of us which hangs somewhere in our, our, our um, let's say meeting room. Uh, it's just a print um, of um, the studiolo in Urbino, which I mean we used at a certain point with our friends at San Rocco as an idea of Bramante, which of course it is not Bramante, but more importantly here I believe it's this inside-outside thought. I mean the fact that ultimately every project is about ambiguity, it's about a mise-en-scene, you can call it a cultural imaginary to a certain extent, but perhaps also it's about a staged lie. So this staged lie keeps us working because we haven't stopped working here. Here and now is also simply about making this project, which is a house, but a house which is perhaps far too big for the site which it inhabits. So as you can see on this drawing, the hedges are almost bordering on the windows and the windows are as big as they can be. So in some strange sense, also that's the mise-en-scene of the private life in endless negotiation with the public. The interior as a fiction 
courses here, uh, which we so often use um, by, by Hockney, used by Venom, and hence for us so important, perhaps. It's of course also trying to find structure in that, and that's an old model I found on one of our shelves. It's a model of Shorehouse, which is a model of the problem of space and the fact that you can't design space as function, but you can just design space and you try to make pockets. Perhaps the pockets here, the pockets we live in, are pockets which were forced by other decisions, uh, by uh, fear for disease. And all of a sudden, the pocket is my room and my flat because I can't leave my flat or the park because I'm forced to run in the park because I can, because in Brussels we could, and in, Par in Paris we couldn't. And all these perimeters are fundamental and how, in a way, they always have a physical edge. And as an architect, we cannot stop thinking about that. So this structure and this grid and this spacing, and here also stru structure, grids and facing in a model we're preparing for next week uh, for a very important uh, kind of step for us that we finally present uh, this Israeli television building, uh, which is now, it's now started construction. But more important perhaps is that here and now we're dealing with these perimeters, these boxes, and the boxes have changed forever. This is a picture of a, plan which is spinned up next to that model of construction which shows the final version so to speak or the final for now and you see that the model hasn't really fundamentally changed and the drawings haven't changed and the lines inside the boxes are different lines and different rooms and studios and studios become media centers and rooms and offices but that's how life unfolds in some sense but the hierarchy hierarchy which is implicit and sometimes gratuitous perhaps but always forces us to think like Baldessari, sadly passed away this year, forces us to think, forces us to think, and all of a sudden translates an idea into a space, into a, a surface, into a composition. And that's of course the box in some sense, the box, which is that box you just saw, the box in the RTS building, the box carrying the plate, the surface, the shop, but also the boxes and its problem in the world. I mean, how is to think that at least here in Europe, Corona makes us all suburbanized, which is terrible. People only go shopping once a week and they make queues and they stay home and they order everything online. And that's the reality which we were facing, with, which is, I mean, only made through the most extreme current version. And people with gardens are more lucky than people without. I have no garden, I don't even have a terrace. So here are these boxes, the boxes which organize that field, that suburbia, and the boxes are boxes of life, boxes as you saw, which was uh, our Trebio project, uh, which is a project where they produce olive oil. I mean, of course, it goes slow in this case, but it goes. And then here another box, which is a box, you could argue, a box of that. It's a crematorium. So it's the same box, and it, at the same time, is fundamental, because perhaps that box replaces church. It's an important place today, a place Reference is a place which is perhaps one of the few places left where you totally, fully, 100% live the civic, live the public, because ultimately also that is important about perimeters and how things go. These perimeters at the inside and the outside, and ultimately also the room, and what is contained in that room or this perimeter is this, which coincides with, I think, which are with its full awareness of ecology, economy, responsibility in many ways, but also architecture very simply. Here a building built around a building which is now almost finished and did not stop in confinement, but here from say our bubble, our operation center, I can only show you the model, it's the model uh, of, of a building which is stronger or wants to appear stronger, rougher, perhaps, uh, more simplistic than it actually is because the real building, the building which we make survive, is contained inside. So ultimately, and here, I think it is also a reflection upon here where we are with all these uh, challenges, which are not new challenges, which are just, I would say, emphasized, is the challenge of whether everything is architecture or whether we have to believe in everything architecture. And so, here, a page from, from Hollands, um, everything is architecture, perhaps in the office of everything architecture. So it's my, my back screen, in some ways. Picture of Stefano Graziani, where the box and the box and the lipstick and the object um, is 
at the same time an act of reappropriation, but also I think a negotiation about what is architectural form and how does it perform. So another of the wall pictures here in the office, which is an old collage for the Bahrain project, where the object itself is very simple and following the rules, but ultimately becomes some kind of icon of hope. That time in Bahrain, as a public idea, measureless, uh, next to this enclosed idea, and I think very metaphoric for where we are, so that we have to renegotiate uh, what we share, what we don't share, how open we are, and how close we are, but this ultimately always was the core of our architecture uh, preoccupation. So in that sense, it's about space that can be occupied um, and where things can be done. I mean, and I, of course, quote what I was asked to deal with. And what can be occupied, and here you see a model of a pavilion which had supposed to be built already, been mounted already in May uh, for Harvard, and now will probably be mounted next year in May, because of course, also these things, uh, they go slower, and which is at the same time an object which is somewhere between a moon lander and a space of occupation as a moon lander, but also the um, Occupy movement, also um, the political movements of Black Lives or otherwise, which is fundamental, and where I think architecture here as a space of negotiation, no more than the machinery, Machinery like the Bahrain uh, say facade is no more than a device which opens and closes. And here is a red flag, an energy box, and a flag. Why this flag? Because, of course, I think every American is supposed to be able to, re, to, re, um, to reconquer that symbol, which now perhaps has been conquered by too limited a group. So here we're back in the office. Well, we never left it because that's the consequence, of course, of where we are here now, still in the midst of Corona. And you see all these objects still. And you see them as we deal with them and nothing has changed with it. Thank you.
here and listening to this, if I'm speaking to the audience, and thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this talk series. Um, I think it's such a brave um, effort and something so instinctive and necessary that we all think that there's this space that's being lost um, in all of our kind of um, will or rush to move towards a, another kind of organized way of life there's all of these bits that get lost you know for example as our universities and colleges struggle to work out what kind of curricula they're going to deliver and whether that's going to be live or in a blended learning environment um, all these kind of operational concerns have somewhat um, in my experience drowned out some of the in-between stuff some of the discussion that is so vital and actually keeps us interested in our fields so again i just want to congratulate the organizers for producing this series um, which is so generous and also i guess it does segue into what i'm going to talk to you about um, as a sort of uh, precursor i was asked to do what i normally do which is to speak off the cuff and do something quite um uh, intuitive so apologies for that I'm not going to be making any kind of determinative imperative claims that I have planned out there'll be no manifestos uh, just to explain what's going on behind me that's also because you're just going to have to listen to me talk for 10 minutes or so um, behind me is a really gorgeous animation that uh, I watched as a student and um, it stayed with me I now share it with my students it's an animation of a 19th century piece of writing called Flatland, which some of you might be aware of. And Flatland was a sort of Victorian um, social satire in which uh, various kind of cultural tropes were being critiqued and, and particularly singular views, singular ways of looking at things, universal systems. So, you know, the grid behind me right now um, accommodates two dimensions but not three and this is the main struggle of Flatland. There are various versions of animations of Flatland. It lends itself to um, mathematics, philosophy, architecture, all sorts of discussions but um, All right, so um, I think we just had a little glitch. Thanks for sticking with it. Um, I feel very honored to be the first major glitch uh, in such an ambitious program. But anyway, I'm gonna get to what I wanted to talk about. And so I was talking perhaps um, about the background too much, but really what I wanna get into is, um, I think the problem I have with systems and uh, the things that fall in between the gaps. So, um, I'd be, I have been talking a lot about a spectrum between optics and ethics. It's maybe overly simple to construct a spectrum like this, um, but it's been helping me to sort of assess where I might find myself in relation to various kinds of um, flux and response that are taking place at the moment, whether I'm talking about um, changes in academia or um, the attitudes of the various kind of sometimes quite large and formal institutions in the face of social change, in the face of collective responsibilities imposed by COVID, and of course um, imposed by the discussions, often painful and awkward, that are coming up um, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. So optics and ethics. Um, I think I'll come back around to it at the end, but I think Traditionally, I found myself, I'm not a confrontational person, I don't think, at least not unless I have to be. Um, and so I tend to find myself gravitating towards ethics and values as a field of operation. So if I'm expecting or hoping for change, I think I tend to sort of operate at that scale of, of understanding why something's happening, what's behind that. My boyfriend gets very frustrated with me when we watch true crime dramas because I'm never really interested in what's happened, but much more 
what's going on behind to, to cause that person to be that way. Anyway, so that's, that's my propensity. Um, but over the last weeks, I've, I've started to understand this not so much as a choice between optics and ethics as a way of sort of including or excluding actions that count or things that have value, but rather to see it as a spectrum because let's take Black Lives Matter for a moment. The, the, the black squares on Instagram, I guess, are a very um, poignant or, or depending on where you stand, now a very easy optical method in which you know what to do, the action's simple, there's metrics, it's measurable, you can see how many people engaged with it, how many people used a hashtag, what have you. Um, it's pleasing in that sense. And it does mean something to be able to create mass and solidarity and to have things that are measurable. Um, and I guess I've just gradually been trying to appreciate that. For example, diversity hires. I mean, I've been in various positions where I've been told that I've got a job because I tick two boxes of being an ethnic minority and being a woman. Um, and in my personal experience, I felt that to be somewhat devaluing, you know, you think, well, shit, well, I thought I got the job on merit because I was good, but it turns out it was just for your figures. Um, and so there's something kind of disturbing about that. And yet, Metrics do matter when you're measuring how many people of color are in positions of power or whatever it is that you happen to be analyzing. Climate change is another good example. There are certain movements and actions um, that are measurable and perhaps easy to take. And there are others which are much more at the messy end of the scale where you're talking about systemic changes and perhaps a readjustment of values which might um, yeah, which might inculcate very slow and messy processes within institutions that have been set in their ways um, or that are integrated with other systems. Things become very complex when you um, try to chip away at the ethics and values end of the spectrum. And I think maybe it's that simplicity of being able to act at the optics end that's, that's rendered me cynical to it in the past. But I'm learning to sort of see or appreciate that various responsive actions, whether it's to climate change or to um, other conflicts, yeah, I'm finding it kind of useful analysis. So following that, um, gonna name drop slightly, but only to share my experience. I took part in a conversation with Keller Easterling um, last week, and it afforded me an opportunity to think about this a little bit more. Um, we were invited by uh, let's say a tech company, a tech arts based collaboration. And we were a little bit, no, I wouldn't say suspicious, but a little bit askance as to what they expected us to talk about. Um, we decided to talk about, well, a lot of what I'm talking about, but largely based on Keller's forthcoming book, Medium Design, which will be out uh, with Verso shortly. We'll plug for that. Um, in which one of her chapters really got me, and it was talking about rhetoric. Um, I was talking about a lot of things, but about being suspicious of simplistic and universal methodologies um, on one hand, which is a little bit what I was talking about in terms of a frustration with systems that leaves gaps. Um, and also about rhetoric. So for example, we were talking about the tendency of cryptocurrency firms um, and certain tech companies to use a very liberal rhetoric predicating on personal freedoms, predicating on personal agencies. Yet, if they feed into the same sort of systems of fungible exchange, which ultimately enables you to take part in the market capital sort of dynamic that we're in, then how radical are these things really? And how freeing are they? And what kinds of freedom are they talking about and for whom? And it just, you know, on a personal level, irks me to see liberal rhetoric being transmogrified into the same kind of neoliberal values that reinforce um, particularly economic situations. And so Keller was talking about um, her sort of parallel suspicion um, about universal theories, about the successive wave that we see, particularly in architecture and urbanism, to systematize a way of understanding things, which often predicates on the singular particle, the module or something, through which we can understand or perhaps a lens of industrialization in the case of capital M modernism, 
it, Keller was talking about this in terms of modernism as in after God, so the universal theory, perhaps it's science or what have you, that then organizes a system, a way of classifying what we're experiencing. And we have a tendency to move towards universal systems, I think, and to put our faith in them. How much of this is cultural and how much of this is biological programming, I don't know. But I think my feeling, and, and I, if I may speak for Keller's, then possibly hers too, is that they're simply inadequate. The modernist systems of whatever lens you want to look at it, whether they're grids or whether they're the tendency of my university um, administration, which now wants to set up you know, a very scheduled phased plan of how we're going to get rid of racism not only my university but many universities how we're going to address this okay here's your six point manifesto do a b c you're not going to be racist anymore appoint this many deans plug in these kinds of classes set up an action group six months we'll be here we'll produce a report i don't know my instinct is to mistrust things that have um this sort of formulaic tendency. I've just got a two minute warning. So I'm just going to try and crowbar in something else that I'm using um, to understand where I am. And that is a text by Dana Meadows, or Donella Meadows, uh, from 1997. So maybe predating some of you. But this uh, Donella Meadows is, is a climate change scientist. And I'll admit that I haven't necessarily been the most engaged in climate change debates. Um, so far, but she talks about points of intervention in this text, which I'm happy to share with the organizers and with you, or you can find it quite easily, um, in which she's talking about um, these various points of intervention and different kinds of points of leverage within a system. I think this parallels the optics ethics spectrum where she's talking about a sort of efficiency of measurable change on one hand, and the possibility of deeper, stickier, slower change, which is not so easy to evidence, on the other hand. So I don't think I'm saying anything radical here. I mean, this is 1997, and I'm sure these ideas of complexity and points of leverage um, of change within a system have been spoken about many times before. But now more than ever, I just um, feel inclined to resist those universalizing systems and rhetorics that come through in um, emergent technology and emergent social discussions as well. Um, and would urge towards much more of a thickening complexity. I know that typically um, for me as a historian, this doesn't yield very easy points of action or very easy metrics, but I mean, it's beyond both and. We're talking about very complex systems of cultural understanding, economic understanding, um, and many, many other systems of measuring and looking at things that I think need to be intertwined and that in our urgency and in our quest to find answers and ways to be and ways to correct awful burdens of guilt or inequality that we feel that we must yet try to resist those easy answers. I'm going to leave it there, but thanks for listening to my rant.
Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Tima. This evening I've decided to slightly deviate from what I was going to do. In terms of my topic, I was going to reflect on an essay I wrote last year called On the Inside Out, The Architecture of Inclusion in the Diversity Economy. And as you'll see, the image I have on the screen is a planning map of Lonsdale Street and a Google Street view of Lonsdale Street. And the essay really kind of intersects with this space and analyzes it in the planning map. You can see that the pale green circle indicates the presence of Aboriginal history and culture or heritage, which is how it's framed in the Planning Environment Act and how it's framed in planning. Lonsdale Street Street View is an image of that map. It's where I worked in planning policy for a number of years. And yeah, I guess at the time when I was writing this, A, I couldn't imagine the era we're living in now in terms of this kind of like radical race revolution, which for First Nations people has been happening probably for 250 years, but seems to be really at this tipping point triggered by what's been happening in, in the US. And I think given that, I kind of wanted to read something else this evening, which hopefully is more hopeful and kind of looks at an alternative to map making methodologies, an alternative to planning rather than looking back on what I read last year, which was more of a kind of overarching critique of structural whiteness in the industry of which, and I actually refer into the essay, I feel like that sort of critique is kind of losing its momentum in the era we're living in. And I kind of want to think in a more sort of lyrical and hopeful way of how we can reshape planning and how we can sort of think about planning environment, built environment professionals in a completely different way. And also maybe look a little bit at the absurdity of how we frame and think about cities. So yeah, I really hope that you kind of connect to this image and kind of hopefully see that it's such a strange way that a planning and environment act and a map can just dictate cities and how we view them. So I will read to you, do planners dream of electric trees? A metal filing cabinet stands at the end of a thin corridor, rarely frequented by the other bureaucrats who otherwise fill the sparse office floor in the 37 storey building. Ministerial briefs are stored in manila folders that accumulate like a library of forgotten administrative details, which were important for a brief moment in someone's career. I file a recent planning approval amongst the hard copy of acts and other policies which inform our work. As I turn to leave, the 1987 Planning and Environment Act makes eye contact with me. I take it, noticing how small and unimposing it is with its flimsy green cover, the exam anxiety it once elicited now seems trivial. As I flick through its pages, redigesting the amendments and special provisions, it slowly occurs to me that a law designed to protect nature is made from trees. If paper still comes from trees, I can't be sure if it still does. Most of my professional transactions are electronic, which makes the experience of touching the act with my fingers feel transgressive. Am I touching a dead tree? Or has technology pacified these aspects of environmental degradation and I've just forgotten? Lost ruminating in the cyclical blur of professional development and global environmental debate. In the new knowledge economy, urban planners must move rapidly through technical and political processes in the development of cities and regions. Trends compete for attention in a frenzied 21st century where basic things like people often fade into the background. 
These tensions were exasperated at a conference where design professionals clamoured for front row seats in the atrium at Fed Square. Anticipating the US strategist, the keynote speaker fresh from Brooklyn's industrial revitalization, she explained to the audience that the future of cities is wearable technology which moderates climate change hotspots, robotic, 5G, driverless, blockchain focused on airspace because there's no land space left, skies thick with drones and data driven because the internet is everything. In this tech revolution, I assume that eco-conscious entrepreneurs have developed treeless paper. And if they haven't, then the solution to the killing of trees must be hidden within the 1987 Planning and Environment Act, which states that the purpose of this act is to establish a framework for the protection of land in Victoria in the present and long-term interest of all Victorians. Trees are of interest and underpin our long-term livelihood. But as I skim through the pages, no clause or selection directly references the protection of trees. Do they deserve their own act? Or is their preservation coded in legislative language, buried amongst the references to the Metropolitan Green Wedge and the Declaration of Distinctive Areas and Landscapes? The act is lengthy. And just as I grasp one section, there is always another clause to the paragraph, which is disorientating. And there are no images of trees or other remnants of the natural environment, which is strange. Does the act assume trees will always be here, growing along train lines on the edge of freeways or on high rise rooftops? A landscape architect invites me to speak to his students in a class called The Politics of Public Space. The idea of landscape architecture sounds like a peculiar contradiction, not dissimilar to the concept of legislating nature, something that should live above the law. But still, I agree to participate. We meet in a new building and don't talk about trees. His students are eager to discuss ideas of gender and race in the built environment as we critique a new building on Swanston Street. Cities are large and unruly and we struggle to retrofit them into the latest thematic buzzwords. But the students move eagerly through the building trying to assess its impact on our humanity. It meets most of our criteria appallingly, despite its architectural form and porousness distinctive of inner city Melbourne. From some angles, you can almost see the trees that grow along Swanston, the city's spine. But their presence is like wallpaper, decorative, but not cultural or nourishing. The landscape architect moves us into a small tutorial room for the second half of class. I'm asked to lead a discussion on the ARM portrait building of William Barrick. And I begin by reading an essay referencing Linda Kennedy. Kennedy conveyed the irony of a black figure in the built form with menacing honesty. Her words cut into my own internal flux. That is, it is bewildering to be an urban planner of Baladong Noongar descent living on another mob's country. But a spark or gut feeling tells me to keep pushing within these professional borderlines, even as they oppress. And if I don't suffocate in the process, then dismantling the borders which both restrict and determine livelihood will seem worth it. I'm aware that this is difficult terrain to traverse as the landscape architect catches me on the intersection questioning why I work in land use policy and not art or academia. Part of the answer is that I see different struggles in these industries that are equally damaging. And I am more interested in border crossing, spilling into these disciplines at night, than leaving an imprint and returning to my desk in the 37 storey building in the morning in Lonsdale Street. Moving across borders is dangerous. 
but claiming one spot has never felt comfortable either. We keep talking about the space between buildings and the ones contained in textbooks like there's a real difference. Another guest speaker asks if I'm, if I'm frustrated by the industry's obsession with preserving heritage buildings in spaces like Fed Square, while birthing trees are at risk of vanishing. The answer is horrifyingly visible in the Australian landscape where Taranullius quietly persists, where Western architecture is revered and Western trees, those clean British oaks and elm trees, which line St Kilda Boulevard are not threatened by tunnels. Cultural ignorance seeps into the industry. But while it is easy to critique, I still see change at the juncture of art, activism, architecture, academia and policy even if the concept of meaningful coexistence seems distant and challenging. Working in the mechanics of a foreign operating system and trying to manipulate the law from within is overwhelming. But I see trees growing in urban areas and understand that they were here before the Western law that attempts to protect them. Trees are visible through the windows of packed trains crammed with office workers. And in the language of Lisa Belair's beautiful Europe Red River Gum and Janine Lean's Bridge Over the River Memory, trees grow in unlikely places beyond planning strategies, urban design theory, legislation, tech revolutions, environmental activism and art. They speak to each other through complex root structures beneath city trees. When we draw lines across our own professional borders, new messages emerge and the possibility of something different grows.
these days, I guess we are all wondering what the we is. Uh, do we dream under the same sky as an ongoing project that questions the we and uh, to some extent also argues for we? More specifically, the we in spatial practice, the we of architects, artists, engineers, clients, users, humans, and non-humans. In a way, it seems to me that we face a paradox today. The field of architecture is both expanding and contracting, both characterized by a multidisciplinary practice and contrary to some extent to the classic self-image of the generalist architect genius. The architect often becomes a marginalized expert for small parts of the building. Most often the facade or the volumetric configuration. Squeezed between art and engineering, between an increasing number of consultants, controllers, developers, philanthropists, etc., and the contemporary architect needs to search for a new position, as I think, mostly uh, to find a new position within the politics of the project. So if politics is about things, as Pumla Latour argues, what is then the politics of a project? How do things function? How are they spatially organized? Who organizes the territory? How are decisions made? How is space shared? After decades of very intense and fundamental critique on planning methods and territorial power, one might say that, of course, this question shouldn't be handed over to architects. Because architecture is certainly a metaphor for control, for static order, for uh, eventually something like state building. But spatial organization, unfortunately, doesn't organize itself. It seems as if structuring a structuring principle is needed. And to some extent, this structural principle is can be circumscribed by what the Greek called Arche. Eventually, therefore, the cultural mechanisms of today direct this issue again to someone like me, an architect. So how can an architect avoid the problematic heritage of the profession? In other words, its tendency to predetermine a final end state, uh, a telos, as the Greek called it. How can the architect counter the primacy of telos, something that is based on a procedure that predetermines and subordinates the place of the various parts? So in this project, Do We Dream Under the Same Sky, we thought about ways out or a kind of alternative. And one alternative to the fixation on the object might be to develop a strategy that refers to the surrealist co-exquisite or uh, the other term that the surrealists use, the cadaver key, the exquisite cadaver, which is a planning and design strategy that embraces chance, improvisation, and ultimately the loss of control, probably some kind of a horror scenario for architects or also the way I was educated as an architect. So the question is how to lose control and eventually still have a building in the end. The building process is, as we um, thought about it, something that is torn apart into its different elements and uh, components, whether functions or um, building parts, and then negotiated between architects, artists, scientists, curators, etc. So we started um, 
the project that was related to um, uh, research at Goldsmiths College run by Andrea Phillips called Curating Architect Architecture. We made a test of the organization of a building and plan and invited a number of architects and artists to, um, to work in a series of faxes with fax, fax machine and uh, in the development of an, of an art institution, starting with an office by Anton Midokle, then a studio exhibition space by Tobias Rehberger, a library by Jan Weizmann, then a studio space by Judith Hoff, a kitchen by Rux Media Collective, and a garden by Rikri Terranesia. And it became clear that this um, that this series of of um, fax exchanges um, rather focused on the misunderstandings or also on gaps within the protocol that we gave the participants. So accident was clearly part of um, the process, also of the quality, and also raised the question, of course, how do you bring all this together in reality? Um, so this was a kind of conceptual starting point um, for a project um, that we started at the land uh, near the, the, Thai, the, the, the city of Chiang Mai in Thailand, in Northern Thailand. The land um, is initiated by Rikri Chiaranija and Kamin Dachai Prasit as a self-sustaining environment emerging from the artistic community. It is intended to be cultivated as an open space uh, around a rice field and allows for all sorts of different experiments, um, whether from from artistic context, architectural context, um, agricultural context, of course. Um, so it's a really open place um, around um, this rice field, and there have been over the time um, a number of interventions um, by artists like Richard Terranija himself, then uh, Karl Michael von Hauswolf with the star house that we see here, um, or um, again the house by Richard. And other artists that are involved are Philippe Parino and François Roche, of course, and um, Superflex. So the final building or one of the new buildings that um, are on the agenda is a workshop building that would basically become a kind of center for the whole land, a structure that comprises studios, um, workshop space, um, space for um, small um, bedrooms. The building will evolve like an exquisite corpse, a collective assemblage unfolding according to the sequential logic of its building elements, developed in collaboration with a variety of different artists engineers and institutional partners so it's also a, a process that has been um yeah testing to an extreme the very notion of site because so far the building has been realized it existed in, in its different components in various locations around the world so here we see the different uh, components um, with uh, a structure, facade, studios, um, infrastructure such as kitchen and toilets, etc. So a first structural test was made in an exhibition at the Swiss Architecture Museum in, in 2014, um, together with students from Cologne and uh, my partner, uh, Michael Müller. And together with, uh, on the basis of this, together with the engineers Bolling and Groman from Frankfurt, we developed a building structure that um, faced on the idea of flexible columns that would allow actually the sequential logic of the cad uh, exclusive cadaver. So for at Basel in 2015, we made the first test of this structure, uh, a mix of bamboo and steel um, with a, a large span and six columns uh, that were here assembled on the big uh, fair plaza in Basel. 
lift it up. And then became a place for um, lectures, um, meetings, and primarily also for eating and cooking. The kitchen elements were uh, dispersed under the big roof. Also a number of gardens uh, with um, herbs from, from the local region. And the, the whole kitchen concept was actually based on a uh, certain idea of improvisation because we limited ourselves with uh, to food that was leftover food whose date has expired and was became redundant to a certain extent for the market. So here we see recruiter Ranija and students from Basel and uh, from Stale School in Frankfurt working here um, and cooking, preparing meals together with uh, Finnish chef Anto Milasnimi. Then there were other venues of that project in Al at Luma. Again, here contextualizing the whole project within the realm of um, the Camargue in the south of France. Um, elements that also were totally dependent on the environmental conditions, uh, i.e. the sun. Um, we worked with um, elements of solar cooking. It became incredibly hot in the sun, but of course didn't work in the shadow. And the idea for these meals was also to, to mix and merge different traditions, um, questioning even in the food who the we is actually. Um, here in this case, in our uh, mixing traditions from the Kamag with Thai food. And the result were partly what Rikrit and Antor called bastard uh, meals. Uh, here a bastard pad thai uh, with a recipe. And later on in the next stage, we um, tested the facade uh, in Aarhus, in Denmark. Here, um, placing the, the names um, and the very sentence that we dream on the same sky, sky uh, around the facade, around the roof, uh, a kind of hanging vertical garden of um, plants and herbs from the uh, coast on the Baltic Sea. Again, here, um, cooking over the whole summer was in the center of the work, bringing together local initiatives um, and, uh, ex and experts from around the world. And this was combined with a series of film projects, video projects here. Um, one of the, the films and videos that were shown by, by um, Fishley and Weiss, um, The Right Way, uh, the story of the bear and the rat. And of course, as a kind of um, ongoing slideshow, Rachel Sussman's The Oldest Living Things in the World, um, uh, documentation of very old plants. Another uh, building element that we looked into after having researched on the, on the facade and also collected the material from these different uh, places such as Basel and uh, Al, uh, was of course the question of energy because the land is meant as a self-sufficient project. Uh, there's no connection to the grid. So we, um, in, this, um, in this approach to, to develop the project off the grid, we were looking into facade elements that would actually provide energy for the building, but potentially for the whole land. So we developed a facade structure, um, quite a light structure, um, based on OPV, which is organic 
photovoltaics and OLED, organic light emitting diodes. So the idea was to develop a hanging structure, hanging these little elements around 20 to 20 centimeters each um, fixed to a bumble bumb structure that this element would actually provide light. And we tested this uh, facade system and this energy system on the occasion of the Biennale in Seoul um, with a very light, large uh, piece of facade um, where you could see the, uh, the text do we dream under the same sky. So basically produce energy during the day and emitted light during the, during the night. This um, piece of facade uh, was then shown in Frankfurt, um, here of course in a very different context, um, certainly testing also the, the, the meaning of the content of, the content, uh, of this sentence, do we dream in the same sky, here very close to the big euro sign uh, in the center of Frankfurt, uh, very close to the European Central Bank, which of course at that time was also um, linked very much to the euro crisis. So this is a detail of these uh, organic photovoltaics and the organic light emitting diodes. And there will be a series of new elements and further components that will be realized by, among others, David Andre for the artist studios and Superflex for the, uh, the biogas station, um, basically um, addressing the full, full um, cycle of um, the land and its uh, production. So this is where the project is. Um, so it's still not there in Chiang Mai at the land. Um, we still circle around the very center of the project, but we keep on gathering new material, um, new ideas um, that are realized with very different partners. And we hope to begin uh, very soon the, the construction in Thailand. But it's, uh, it's certainly questioning as a whole the project, the uh, very possibility of working together and um, the very idea of togetherness. And um, we face in the, these days of social in distancing, certainly a particular challenge. And it's a challenge that I would say um, will still insist on the togetherness, but it's as if this project do we dream under the same sky, also after almost eight years now, um, is more and more fragmented. So one of the big challenges is actually how to bring it together. And I'm not sure whether it actually needs an architect to bring it together. This is what everybody expects from us architects, but I'm sure we can't do this alone. Thank you for your attention and it was a pleasure to be part of the series. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Wana X from uh, Proctora in Mexico City, and I was asked to give a short talk um, entitled With a Detour. The text uh, 
the title comes from a text we wrote about 10 years ago, I suppose, uh, exploring our own uh, design methodologies, trying to figure out how our projects at Productora come to be. The text basically explained that if we looked for the keys to resolve a design problem within the given facts of the design problem itself, we would always produce just standard answers and arrive at the same generic solutions already produced many times before. Therefore, we use our own interests and fascinations as a way to focus on something completely outside of the real problem and thereby, through a detour, arrive at no findings, no design solutions. In this short talk, I will do it the other way around. I will not really explain the genesis of the projects. I will not unfold the projects in their totality, nor even describe their essence, but mainly focus on some ideas of materiality. Through this detour again, I can then try to construct a new reading, create a new understanding of our own work, a somewhat improvised lecture trying to reflect on a possible meaning of materiality in the work we produce. I'll try to show you some, some new work as well. The first project we're going to talk about is the Tepan Soko Cultural Center, a project we realized in 2017 with a good friend Isaac Broid. It's a cultural complex uh, made out of concrete right in front of the uh, pre-Hispanic pre pyramids of Tepan Soko. The choice for concrete was, uh, for this new building was a very specific choice, as it, in a certain sense, is the same material as the pyramids in front of us. Mexico City street noise in the background. Many pre-Columbian pyramids are just built putting stones upon stones, often very large stones. Frequently, they also use pre-Hispanic mortar, argamasa, in between the stones. Nowadays, in our contemporary architecture, we grind those stones, those huge stones or boulders into fine gravel. And the pre-Hispanic mortar is replaced by Portland cement. So we don't have to stack or puzzle or building together, but we can just pour our buildings. The artist Michael Heiser, who traveled often with his father, Robert Heiser, to Mexico and then later also to Peru and other places in Latin America to do archaeological research, would say, the way I understand it, there are two kinds of societies. The megalithic society, which used and worked with massive pieces of material and created large structures, and piecemeal societies, which also built large structures, but made them out of many small rocks, putting all the little pieces together to make one big object. The megalithic structures aren't as big as the piecemeal structures, but they have more impact and more feeling, according to me. Nowadays, we are a piecemeal society. We make big things out of little things. Our buildings are millions of fragments stuck together. Now, it's not only in its materiality and its basic uh, that, that our building relates to the pre-Hispanic pyramids. It's also in its basic formal and spatial qualities that the building copies and interprets the pre-Hispanic example. The steep angles the steep steps of the historic buildings are replaced by softly inclined surfaces though. Smooth steps you can take up to the different viewing areas. The tone of the concrete we use has the same color as the burnt grasslands of the Mexico highlands. The building touches the ground, making way for the basic geometric volumes to become more complex as they touch upon the existing topography. The building has apertures, openings, giving way and possibilities to access its cavernous insight. Now with our predilection to work with very robust construction materials, elements that have in itself already a color and a mass and a texture like wood, concrete, stone, etc working in the US and working for example for this house in, in Los Angeles, working with materials that have their predefined qualities already is difficult in an architectural system, in a system of construction that depends a lot on the way things are finished, painted, stuccoed, etc. When we modeled this basic bungalow in the Echo Park neighborhood of Los Angeles, we maintained the simple wooden tract house from the 1920s as such, and we just added the blue steel structure in the back. You can see it peeping out here. Very 
a very dual system. But both the wood and the steel had to be painted. We proposed a foxtail brown pink for the existing house and a night blue for the steel structure, a basic color coding. The brown pink, here you can see the objects we made for the 44 low resolution houses exhibition. The, the brown pink would be the intimate historic interior, the protected part of the residence, the domestic. The blue would be an open structure towards the garden, towards the landscape, towards the horizon and the sky. They both stand as independent element next to each other. They hardly touch each other, creating in this awkward sexual position of wood and steel, of blue and pink, a new atmosphere. Something that is not the LA bungalow or Boston beam house as it could be defined by the wood, nor the case study modernism as it would be defined by the steel. Generating a new type of atmosphere, a new type of language that is then further extended into the interior of the house. Another project we did in LA, we just finished it, uh, and these pictures are probably uh, a week old, uh, is a library and a writing studio for Christopher Hawthorne. When Hawthorne was appointed Chief Design Officer of the City of Los Angeles in 2018, and thereby left his position as a full-time critic at the LA Times, he had to move back his library from his office at the newspaper to his own house in Pasadena. And he asked us to rethink a small structure behind the carport in his garden. It had to serve as a reading and writing studio, at the same time needed to function as well as a guest unit. The studio that we made is characterized by the blue bookshelves wrapping around a rectangular space, a single gesture to organize and divide the main space from the service space. A clear defined horizon with an irregular pitched roof that distributes indirect light all over the space. In the end, it will be the colorful books and not this abstract blue that will give character and color and life to the space. The design such uh, integrates a flare flexible storage for books and a desk, you can see in this image here, and a door with access to a small bathroom. This is another project like the previous one that relies on a basic dual relationship, a dichotomy between tones, colors, materials, temperatures. The light filters into the bill-shaped rounded bathroom that is lined with a grid of white tiles through a clear story window above. It, our both spaces are shared and covered by a continuous roof, but each have their own quality, their own character. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about this book. I just have the first copies in my hand. It will be probably in the bookstores uh, this uh, summer. It's called uh, Being the Mountain. Uh, and it's uh, a new book we produced uh, with Doug Dora. It's the result of two years of teaching at the IIT in Chicago, invited by the Miss Crown Hall uh, America's Prize. It, it's written by Doug Dora and has contributions by uh, Frank Escher, Veronique Pateo and Jesus Basalo. The book explores basically the, the relation between modern architecture and topography, landscape and geology. Early modern architecture um, was defined by the plan, mostly by the plan, and often the adaptation to topography hardly existed, like in this uh, 1950s house by Craig Elwood, which is basically just a flat uh, single story house placed on stilts. The Pilotis of Le Corbusier where in the end a means to solve, to mediate and to ignore the topography, a precise topography at least. It is said that Le Corbusier only visited La Tourette's construction site once during construction. The thesis of this book is that somewhere halfway 20th century, um, there's an interest that arose to start working with topography, with the landscape, with the earth and the surface, especially motivated by the expert of modern architecture to mer more peripheral parts of the world, Mexico and Brazil, but also LA or Palm Springs, etc., or to smaller towns all across the globe. This wish to start working with the earth and with the topography goes hand in hand or is more or less simultaneous with the rise of uh, landscape, of land art, 
like this image by Michael Heitzer from 1969. Michael Heitzer, so where, as where many architects were in search of the real materiality in contrast to our piecemeal way of building. This image, of course, reminds me of Hillary, Hillary's and Michael's lecture from last week on rocks and other things. Here you can see these beautiful images of the houses built by Artigas in the Pedregal in the southern part of Mexico City, where these volumes, these modernist volumes, contrast with the lava outcroppings of the site. I want to read you a quick quote from Jean Baudrillard in his book System of Objects, where he discusses the rebuilding of an old country house in France. Rather, as a church does not become genuinely a sacred place until a few bones or relics have been enshrined in it, so this architect cannot feel at home until he cannot sense the infinitesimal yet sublime presence within his brand new walls of an old stone that bears witness to past generations. There was a necessity to bring this geology, this presence of time into the buildings. You see this in the previous images of uh, the Pedregal site in Mexico City, but also, for example, the Laudner architecture, both in LA and Palm Springs. Here you see how these how this elements are domesticated. These rocks almost have the same function as the flowers underneath it. Or here in the Hilltop House, in California, again by Artigas, how this out rock outcropping becomes a sort of domesticated element within the space of modern architecture. It could bring life, reality, materiality into the slick lines of modern architecture. I watched with a lot of interest the amazing presentation and the amazing work of Anholtrop from last week. And I can't stop to relate this need for this presence, this, this presence of geology, of, of real matter, of materia, of prehistory, to this previous incorporation of massive natural object into the domestic realm. As you can see here, the house by Albert Frey in Palm Springs, his second home. If his historicist tendencies in late modernism, late modern or postmodern architecture try to incorporate the human history into its buildings, to give our architecture meaning, purpose. Are we now looking to incorporate the universal history, the geology, the tectonic, the prehistory into our architecture? A longing for features that represent a world before the Anthropocene, a world in which human activity was not yet a dominant factor of life on this planet. This next project is also relatively new. We just opened it for an art fair in uh, February, just before the pandemic. It's a rooftop prim. It's an intervention on top of an early 20th century building in uh, Mexico City, in the center of Mexico City. It's basically a continuous roof structure, measuring more than 50 meters in length, covering three existing patios and generating new covered surfaces, as you can see here, in between the patios. The structure consists of 45 lightweight metal trusses, each 1.2 meters apart, dividing the weight evenly over the existing structure, accentuating rhythm and perspective along the roof. As it floats above the existing patios, it allows them to still be ventilated, to have plenty of daylight and to even have a view to the sky, but protected from the rain to allow activities to take place in them. The intervention proposed a different set of materials. Materials that contrast starkly with the roughness, the materiality, the texture of the existing historic building. We used light and industrialized materials, synthetic materials, compounds formed through a chemical process by human agency, as opposed to the one of the existing building, original uh, natural materials like wood and stone, etc. This roof you can see here is made out of polycarbonate sheets. The deck is a PVC composite deck. The hand railings made of nylon nets. The shade structures are made of high density polyethylene, a thermoplastic polymer. In daytime, the intervention almost disappears in the sea of cheap roof structures, lightweight utility sheds, extraction fans, plastic umbrellas, acrylic skylights, AC equipments, and cheaply improvised roof structure. At night, it appears as a well-lit bacon in the heart of Mexico City. 
a last and again a recent project, is the Bautista House in the south of Mexico City. Here again, we work with pigmented concrete. It's a, the house is situated on a beautiful piece of land in between the Caribbean Sea and an interior lagoon, underneath a wide open sky of Quintana Roo. We were looking to, to, to use a blue concrete. This project reminded me a lot of a very early project of Productora, a project from 2006, the Tsunami Memorial site, where we already understood that the line we draw between land and sea is actually not a line and is more like Mark Manners singing Sailor's Book that came out in 2002 and that we really, really loved using that cover as a reference images where the division between land and sea or between the blue and the green is just a sort of continuous blur. We wanted to do something with that uh, fragility with that blending of different elements. As I said, we were looking to build a house in blue concrete. While for Picasso, for example, in his blue period, the blue was a, was a color of sadness and depression. For us, the blue represents very open and neutral color, a calming presence, like the ocean or the sky, something that's always there, but demands no attention. When we started working with our concrete provider, we started to discuss to use blue concrete, he told us that they use an organic natural pigment gel into their concrete and they would not be able to predict how it would react in the bright sunlight. It was absolutely not recommended to be used as an outside color. The salinity of the air, the colors, the blue would be absolutely unstable. We love the idea to work with this unpredictability and the client, the young creative mind immediately supported it. We casted the whole house out of blue concrete. We built a house with walls that reacted according to its exposure in the sun, according to their position in the house. A reminder of the presence of time, of the inevitable appearing and disappearing of things, of our transitoriness. These are all pictures taken by, by Honest Luca of these different shades of blue in relation to the sky and the sea. In the end, we created a house with a changing range of tones. It goes from the, from the blue of the waves, the blue of the sky, to the pink of the sunset. And I believe this is the last image of my presentation. Thank you very much. Is that
Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is Hideyuki Nakayama. I'm an architect based in Tokyo. First, I would like to introduce an interesting story about Apollo 16. I love this story. Look at the size of that biggie. <laughs> it is a biggie, isn't it? It may be further away than we think. Because no, it's not very far. It was just right beyond you. Theoretically, huh? Yeah. I got everything else around here a couple of weeks later. That's about uh, halfway, uh, maybe. <laughs> Mike, tell me. Go ahead. Yeah, it looks like the battery's still the... the uh, All these in this area look... Uh, a little bit higher. Charlie chipped out of the... Uh, just use a little more wire, right? Yeah, it use a little more. Okay, that sounds like a good guy. Look, see this rock right here, Charlie? Look at the size of that rock! We can see. The closer I get to it, the bigger it is. Yeah, but look at the pearl shattered part, Charlie. On this side over here? Yeah. No, yeah. right here on this one. As you see, Two astronauts are walking on the moon. They saw a car-sized rock in the distance and decided to walk to the rock. However, the farther they walked, it seems that they couldn't reach the rock. The rock was much farther than they had imagined. And by the time they got to the rock, they found out that the size of the rock was as big as a house. There is no air on the moon. In a world without aerial perspective, we lose our sense of distance. And there is another important fact. That is, there are no artificial objects on the moon. An artificial object is a ruler of the size. Without it, there is no size in nature. For example, think about catching a very big fish. When you want to show it on Instagram, you would put a cigarette box next to it. Artificial objects are the size to the natural landscape. Architecture is one of the biggest rulers. Therefore, building architecture in an empty field gives you a very big impact because it adds a size to the landscape. I'm always afraid of this. Now, today, I would like to talk about the first project that won a competition since I had started my own office. The site was a countryside of Hokkaido Prefecture in Japan. It was a vast natural grass field. This field was owned 
by a famous confectionery company. They decided to build a tea house for people who would come to a picnic on a sunny weekend. A picnic is wonderful. What would you first if you went to the meadow with your lover or family? That is to decide where to put the blanket. Everyone becomes an architect and seriously seeks out the best place. If your judgment is bad, it will be a terrible afternoon. So choosing a site is one of the most important missions of the day. You wouldn't want to sit close to other couples and would set a real distance and decide it your place. The view that every one of them thinks that they found the best spot is wonderful. And no one could design this amazing scene because it was completely happened spontaneously. If an architect appeared there and designed the tea house, what would happen? No more boyfriends and dads as an architect and would say, where is the toilet? Where is the trash box? How should this contradiction be resolved? We decided not to design a room with chairs and tables in a room with a roof because no one would go out on the meadow on a rainy day. Instead, we designed to build two very small buildings. One was a small shop selling snacks. The other was a tiny barn storing garden furniture and blankets. I made them as small as possible and put them on both ends of the natural meadow. However, these two buildings had very large doors. When you open the door, the building was hidden behind it. I placed enlarged doors in the field where there were no artifacts that could be a measure. Put a minimized cigarette next to the fish. It's a cheat. We did the opposite. We maximized the ordinary door. You'd surely feel the visit field. The bus field is like a cozy living room with two doors. This is a timber building. Only the interior walls are painted white. When the sunlight hit it, it looks like a white hole in the space. 
It's a small, large living room sandwiched between two doors that connect somewhere, not here. A planning of the room is redrawn daily by the visitors spontaneously. When they leave and the doors are closed, all the details disappear from the building. It's not a rural anymore. This was our proposal. We won this competition, but after that, unfortunately, the owner's policy changed and this project has been frozen. We had almost finished the detailed design. So today, I'm very happy to have the to have opportunity to present you a plan that did not realize. What I wanted to talk talk about today, it means that every human being has abilities of architects like boyfriends and dads at picnic. However, architecture and architects sometimes hide their abilities. It's a very big issue and seamer for me. Everyone can find the best place in their own way in architecture and city if it's like the picnic field that I dream. What kind of shape will that be? This is an endless question for me. I would like to continue thinking about the shape of the architecture, architecture just like the picnic field, even if it's in a city. Thank you very much.
Hello, no, I'm Anna Neymark. Um, I'm recording this in Los Angeles, um, where I, I teach and I work. My collaborator, Andrew Awood, and I started a practice first office here almost 10 years ago. I'd like to thank Guillermo, Anna, Eric, and Colby for inviting me to participate in today's events. Um, and of course, you know, um, in LA right now, um, we have both the quarantine and um, the protests uh, going on at the same time, a total sense of isolated interior and a kind of collective exterior. And um, the project I'm going to show tends more to the quarantine side rather than the protest side, but I'll speak toward the end, hopefully in a kind of conclusive way or uh, as, a, as a way to <laughs> inconclusively conclude, I'm going to try to understand maybe the next steps of trying to reconcile my own um, kind of urge to, uh, to be political um, uh, in my kind of personal life and uh, maybe some of the academic work um, that has in a way, um, uh, it maybe ignored some of these, uh, some of the situation. I'm going to share my screen now and uh, share with you an exhibition. So the show I'll talk about is called Root Forms Among Us. And I worked on this in collaboration with Frederica Yard, um, who is the photography curator and um, head of the, of the uh, archive of Eugène Trita at the Natural History Museum in Toulouse. Um, this um, exhibition uh, was meant to conclude in April, but of course it's still on um, and it is now quarantined inside of this gallery. As you can see, there are two parts to the exhibit. On the one hand, a photography collection on display, and on the other hand, a kind of house um, uh, built at full scale um, inside of the space. Now, um, when the organizers asked me to present today, they gave me the title, Three Stones from the Perimeter of an Interior. I thought that was an amazing reading of the mind because um, at the subject of these photographs is the Dolmen de Vaur, a um, monument, a prehistoric monument, um, composed of three stones forming the perimeter of the interior, capped by a kind of awkwardly broken capstone. Um, the kind of technical term for those stones are orthostates, and so what we see is one um, very long orthostate forming an almost wall and two truncated ones that tend to be kind of, in my understanding, almost like chunky columns. Um, and uh, of course, what we also see is that it's uh, part of the landscape. Um, and so here, uh, I have to kind of remind myself a little bit of the text by Rosalind Krauss, uh, where she talks about um, the kind of definition for um, the new modes of sculpture making in the 1970s that she describes as neither landscape nor um, architecture, uh, as a way to understand a sculpture in the expanded field. And I, I wonder what this dolmen represents to us as architects, whether or not um, it can kind of connect some of the ideas of uh, landscape and architecture in one place. Um, so what I think about when I look at uh, Dolmen Davo is a kind of maybe parallel that we can bridge um, to uh, the modern icon of the domino by Le Corbusier. Um, on the left-hand side, the domino has a series of columns and a series of floor plates and a staircase, all the kind of minimal conditions for architecture. And on the other hand, the dolmen also has the orthostates and the capstone forming a kind of interior, a kind of loose interior in a, in a very modern sense. Um, the difference, though, is quite significant. And here we can kind of turn to Peter Eisenman's multiple drawings of that initial um, kind of uh, patent uh, sketch by Le Corbusier into a series of axonometrics that describe uh, the domino as an authored object of architecture, as the kind of minimal, what I call the minimal, or what he called the minimal condition, where uh, even the spacing between columns and the spacing uh, of floor plates and the condition of the landing of the stair all produce a kind of sign um, that points toward the architect. Um, now, on the other hand, when uh, we started drawing every single dolmen on different kind of continents, we recognized the uh, unauthored relation of one specimen to the next, um, the difficulty in producing a kind of syntax, and the kinds of ways in which um, 
although we can understand each one of these as a dolmen, we don't actually understand them as um, a kind of precision uh, system or as a kind of particular model from which to build anything. Um, what is important, it seemed to us, was that they are precisely outside of the lineage of um, kind of Western architectural pedagogy and thinking, and that they, that they exist on every single continent. So we have represented here those dolmens from South Korea and Tunisia and Wales and Spain and France and Pakistan and India um, and uh, Guatemala and even New York. Um, so we have a, a kind of um, starting point of um, kind of architectural monument building, um, uh, something that uh, in a way precedes everything, um, but brings the entire humanity together. And this is that kind of collective exterior, perhaps, that I mentioned at the beginning. Now, the exhibition begins with these two particular prints. I'm kind of giving you a tour here, but these two prints by Truta that juxtapose um, two very significant photographs, or at least significant for me in the way in which I was thinking about this photography show developing into a kind of understanding of architecture and architectural architecture's media. On the right hand side, we see a bunch of people sitting on top of a dolmen. And on the left hand side, we see a bunch of people sitting on top of a car. Now, the dolmen is a 6,000 year old monument and the car is a technology almost of the future for 1880 when these photographs were taken. In juxtaposing them through the medium of photography, we can actually collapse the time of a kind of prehistoric object with a technologically modern object into the same landscape, into the same space. And I think that in my mind, I'd like to do something similar. Looking at dolmens, I'd like to be able to understand them not as objects in the past, but as objects that exist right here with us in the present. They exist in the landscape and therefore they are part of our uh, kind of aesthetic sensibility. They're part of our also tectonic sensibility. So what I wanted to take from this was a kind of diagram for um, thinking about uh, not just root stone monuments, uh, which is a kind of technical term for these objects, that they are made of rude, not hewn stones and stacked simply one on top of the other, but to think of them as a translation into root forms something that kind of calibrates uh, an, a discussion about contemporary sensibilities. These are the beautiful hands of my collaborator, Frederica Yard, who in Toulouse was showing me the collection of glass plates, um, silver oxide um, projected onto as a kind of negative imprint of the monuments portraits of Anfas and on profil. And then as well, we uh, looked for the prints uh, that Truta himself uh, had made on paper. And so when uh, Frédéric uh, enters um, into the, the space of, uh, of LA, she kind of, she of course uh, brought all of this work with her and here she's uh, preparing um, the photographs for the show. Now in the same way, um, uh, so these things kind of enter the space. And um, in the same way, uh, you see the old prints on the right hand side in one of the rooms um, they're now uh, sitting on a pedestal. And on the other hand, you also see the model of that same uh, space kind of uh, positioned within a different room. Um, that model, of course, as you will see, um, is based off the uh, profile uh, photographs um, of the original Dolmen de Vaur. And here I'm just kind of placing a capstone on top. But what I think was important to us was to think of the structure of setting stones and setting them simply by gravity into a composition of a floor plan um, was a way to understand maybe something uh, about domesticity. And so instead of um, counting the rooms of this house, we tried to understand what it means for every single stone to actually be a sort of infrastructure for the house. So that each stone became either a kitchen or a closet or a bathroom or a Murphy bed or storage for gardening tools. Um, and so these infrastructural objects produce the interior of the space. Of course, none of the uh, water was running, none of the electricity was set in, but we placed all of the walls into the space of the gallery. And here uh, you see the SIP panel, structural insulated panels coming up uh, almost kind of <laughs> magically in a span of a couple of weeks um, and basically holding up the space. Um, 
on the right-hand side, Austin Anderson, the master builder. On the left, Ben Weisgall, who uh, thought uh, very carefully about the design, but also about the kind of tone of, of the space. Um, we also worked with Rob Sipchin and others. Um, now, what, uh, and uh, here Austin is holding a little cantilever of the roof where it cracks, cracks open. Um, what was important um, here, here is my team. So uh, uh, Austin, Rob, and then what was important, and here I'm kind of knocking on this monument, is that this one, the house, um, is not made of stone. It's made, of course, of um, a kind of OSB, very cheap material. It's in strand board that we then painted uh, what's called a forest black, uh, Dan Edwards, but it's a very shiny, um, dark green, uh, diluted paint. Um, now, in the backdrop, something different occurs, and you can kind of see exaggerated tone uh, from Joshua White's photograph, is that the white wall was actually off-white and produced um, a kind of pinkish tone for the entire air of the gallery. Um, there is also, and you will notice it now that I'm kind of putting my hand on the edge of the room, um, another line uh, which we call wainscoting. It's a 38 inch line um, that allows the paint of the kind of shiny light gray uh, concrete to extend onto the wall, producing a kind of horizon line uh, beyond the space of the house. These are some views from the interior. Now we're on the roof, uh, so I'm bringing you up here to begin to talk a little bit about um, the kind of conclusive remarks, let's say, and to say that at some moment where the roof breaks into two parts, um, you can begin to understand how this entire thing is constructed from the idea of the model. The model uh, as something that represents, let's say, foam core. The SIP is the kind of structural um, and real life, perhaps, uh, material that kind of mimics foam core. But basically, the foam core model is one that can be scored and cut in such a way that just a piece of paper holds the entire roof together. I wanted to reintroduce that at the full scale. Um, I'd like to stop sharing the screen and just um, speak for a moment about some of the things I'm thinking about next. Um, and uh, I think that uh, one, um, one thing that uh, has become kind of quite important to me is to consider what it means for architects, especially in, uh, in uh, America, in, in the United States, to work inside of galleries, because this is something that we do, that's something that is part of our kind of academic exchange of information, of the kind of disciplinarity of some of the work that we do. Um, I mentioned Rosalind Krauss's text at the beginning, and of course, she was talking about a very uh, positive moment uh, in the work of sculpture, where the work of sculpture exited the gallery and opened itself up to a kind of broader landscape. What happens in our work is that we actually take buildings from outside of the gallery and we squeeze them in. And we squeeze them in with all kinds of clever tricks of thinking about uh, certain kinds of um, details of paint and uh, details of reference uh, and archival thinking. And these are all very internal. And this is what I mean by the quarantine of ideas kind of quarantine them to the interior of the gallery. And I'd like to say that perhaps today we can rewrite Rosalind Krauss's essay, but in a somewhat critical um, stance to say that we have produced an architecture in a shrunken field. Um, we've in a way pushed it into the interior and for it to kind of burst out into the open and to join um, the kind of the movement of the people, uh, we need to really rethink about what it means to uh, to burst open some of those those walls and what kind of architecture might become possible um, through this exchange. Uh, what happens when this house actually exits the confines of the gallery? What happens when we produce an architecture in the extended field again, which is where it belongs um, in the first place? That is uh, my final thought for today. I thank you so much and uh, see you soon.
Thank you for joining me for this talk and to the From Here, For Now team for inviting me. When I received the invitation to be part of this series, we had all settled into new patterns in our day-to-day -day because of COVID-19. I was to speak on the topic of toward a newer interior in this new context. The new title was a really thoughtful prompt for me to reconsider the structure of the book during this time of isolation, now that the interior has become even more pronounced. I would like to start with a brief introduction that frames the organization of the book in order to reframe it in our current context. The book starts off with this diagram arranged as nested layers, starting with the body at the center, surrounded by concentric rings that identify elements of the interior with proxemic relationships to the body. These layers include those closest to the body, such as clothing and moves outward to objects that the body engages. And finally, onto surfaces that bridge the threshold of interior and exterior. In the context of COVID-19, these layers take on new meaning. The chapter titles progress from one to another, incorporating and absorbing the contents of the previous, similar to the diagram. In our current state, with many of us still in domestic bubbles, the, nor the normal rhythms and schedules of our days have changed. So rather than traversing back and forth across the threshold of interior and exterior, many of the activities we would normally do are turned inward on a continuous loop. Activities such as going to work, school, the grocery store, the gym, where over the course of a day, we would traverse many thresholds, but have now diminished. All these activities have now shifted into the interior. And rather than traversing the last layer, interior and exterior multiple times, we now traverse our interior thresholds more frequently from room to room, floor to bed. In the context of these chapters, it results in greater overlap between rings or bubbles as these activities stay on the inside. The new column of chapters to the right highlight distinct layers, but now informed by frequent overlap from other layers highlighted in blue. This is one way that COVID-19 brings change to a newer interior and will guide a series of slides in this talk. While the chapters and nested layers organize a transition of scales, what I'd like to think of as nearsighted to farsighted, there are many themes that traverse all these layers. This allows the index to be arranged as a resource with themes that are integral to many layers of the interior rather than associated only with one. In the context of COVID-19, I went to the index and looked at the entry on air and saw that it was also connected to health issues, which then expanded the topic to include concentrations, risk documentation, time spent indoors and ventilation, all which become tied to our new rules of conduct in physical distancing and changes to the way we occupy our interior spaces. The collection of these health factors can be brought back to the individual body as a starting point for the layers that surround us, but also the body as an emitter or receiver of viruses. The same diagram used to organize the book is made slightly simpler here. I have added examples at the bottom that if drawn upward represent layers of the interior. This diagram from the book can be seen in relationship to proxemics, the distances between people that set up a range of social relationships. These four are the standard distance relationships among people, with the intimate being very close, the personal spanning up to four feet being the scale of what we might experience on public transportation, then the social range, which can include a number of programs such as workplaces, but like the previous, these fit within interior spaces, while the public distance infers a greater span of space between people, such as being outside. A few weeks into COVID-19, we saw the traditional label of social distancing change to physical distancing, since the designations imply very different understandings of human contact. Physical distance can be measured, but should not exclude socializing, even if through non-traditional contact. I would now like to move into a few examples from the book, but reconsidered in our new context. 
The space around the individual is highlighted in the first chapter with works of Rebecca Horn and her series of body fans. The author, Doris von Drothen, writes that, quote, Horn begins to reinvent her universe by establishing her very own measuring system as a means of comprehending and creating space. She proceeds empirically, using the human body, its movements, and its proportions as her yardstick to measure the universe, end quote. Doing this places her at the center and the fans scribe the space or infer a bubble around her. In a newer interior, we have our own bubble, one that advises us to stay six feet or two meters apart using the body once again as the starting point from which we measure. The second chapter in the book is focused on clothing and identity. The image on the right by William Bloomer Pollock shows the design for a tool called a conforming device, which allowed for making patterns to construct a highly tailored garment to fit the body. The idea of a fitted garment is now more critical at the scale of a mask. The tighter the fit across the face, the better it is for protecting others. What was once conspicuous consumption with wasted fabric left over from a fitted garment is now repositioned so that excess fabric has value since the cutoffs can be used for making a mask. On the left, this face pa mask pattern is typical in that it uses multiple layers of fabric. Ideally, it would be at least four layers of a tight weave. The reason a fitted mask is so important is that it protects others from you and droplets we emit from a sneeze, cough, or talking. The concept only works if everyone wears one. The word bubble has been used more in these past few months than I've ever heard and taken to another scale. It can also be used to describe droplets from a cough or a sneeze. This research by Professor Lydia Burweba documents the cloud of droplets produced from a sneeze. She writes, peak exhalation speeds can reach up to 33 to 100 feet per second creating a cloud that can span approximately 23 to 27 feet, end quote. She explains how, like a cloud, the droplets can change depending upon the humidity, and the path and direction can also change depending upon a room's ventilation and airflow direction from HVAC systems. Eventually, the droplets disperse, and better yet, if a person is wearing a mask, most of this will be caught in the fibers. When considering something as simple as a sneeze, physical distancing on the interior without a mask brings forward a set of relationships. For example, while many activities on the interior might seem commonplace, there is a hierarchy from the least to most chance of transmitting a virus that will cause infection, with the least starting with breathing, then talking, then singing, then musical instrument playing, and finally coughing and sneezing. Without a mask, the sneeze in the context of a six foot distance shown in the diagram on the right would increase the need for a greater distance between people on the interior. These common activities just listed, breathing, talking, singing, and so on, are not unusual. But during this time of viral transmission, the common has to be reconsidered. Georges Perec speaks to the quotidian cycle of activities and elements. He writes, what we need to question is bricks, concrete, glass, our table manners, our utensils, our tools, the way we spend our time, our rhythms, to question that which seems to have ceased forever to astonish us. We live true, we breathe true, we walk, we open doors, we go downstairs, we sit at a table in order to eat, we lie down on a bed in order to sleep, how, where, when, why. I would like to further this part on our table manners, our utensils, how we sit at a table in order to eat in our current context. And apply this to one of the examples in the book by Diller and Scafidio, their early installation at the Cap Street Gallery where the focus was on highlighting past property lines in the gallery space and materializing them in a domestic setting. I never thought I would be speaking about the role of the leaf tucked under a dining room table that allows for expansion to accommodate more people. But in the context of limiting exposure when eating and talking, the materialized cut line is now used to hypothetically 
further cut and pull apart the table to reach a greater distance than six feet or two meters to accommodate even fewer people rather than more. The previous example focused on people around a table. And this next one from the chapter on furniture and objects looks to Le Corbusier's argument to move away from unnecessary decoration and the excess of the Victorian era and towards type objects in his essay, The Decorative Art of Today. He aims to make a convincing case for industrial objects by repeatedly referring to them as, quote, well-made, neat and clean, pure and healthy, end quote. He further seeks to reinforce this argument in the context of the office environment where, quote, to get down to work in the, super in the superb office of a modern factory in which healthy activity and industri industrious optimism reign, end quote. The words healthy and clean are used to legitimize the argument and reinforce the need to break from the past. A similar argument was also used after World War II by the East German government to promote plastics for domestic objects since they could be wiped clean. The need for a healthy workspace has already been implemented in makeshift configurations evident in commercial spaces from cafes to hardware stores, where plexiglass screens and, or plastic sheets aim to mitigate the spread of particles or droplets that can reach another person. Plexiglass allows workers to still have visibility and can be wiped clean. The argument for surfaces that can be wiped clean to promote a healthy environment is not wrong. In fact, it is more relevant than ever. This image places the reflective desk surface front and center to support this argument. Referring back to Professor Buruweba's research, she writes, quote, droplets that settle along the trajectory can contaminate surfaces while the rest remain trapped and clustered in the moving cloud, end quote. In another paper by Parvin et al., they note in their research that, quote, cleaning is fundamental to infection control, end quote. But even 50 wipes with a cloth cannot remove a complex and realistic biofilm from a surface. From the perspective of another chapter, work for many has moved into the domestic bubble and brings coworkers into homes through Zoom calls, Google Meet, Skype, and many other forms of virtual communication. In the chapter on private chambers, I highlight the work of photographer James Casebeer, whose photographs are the product of small architectural models he constructs of building typologies. Because it is a model, it gives him the liberty to bring in new narratives. The image on the right is one of these photographs produced from a model, and the image on the left is the space outside of a model in his studio. Together, these show his final work, but also the place of work and the periphery. Even this talk today shows you only a sliver of my home, but not the full room. The way we now look at our screen or how others see us is vastly different from all of us sitting in a room together with overlapping conversations. We now experience the compression of the virtual screen and the sliver of space beyond. In our domestic bubble, we have the advantage of seeing what is in front of us and behind us. The image on the left is a photograph of another small scale model constructed by Casebeer. On the right is a space in his studio designed by David Ajay and shared with Casebeer's wife, Lorna Simpson. There are similarities between these two images that compress the virtual and the real. The angle of perspective is in one view designed by the architect and in another view designed by the photographer and a simulacra of another interior. The same can be found in another photograph by Case Beer on the left and an entry threshold of the real studio space adjacent to where his studio work takes place. These images and their relationship are meant to draw attention to the sliver of the virtual and the larger room in which we work and the influence they can have on one another as we remain in a feedback loop of interior. At the scale of public performance, I highlight the work of Petra Blaze and her use of textiles and surface treatments in defining the interior of the Casa de Musica by OMA. While these surfaces come to the foreground in this image, they are now pushed to the background since the closeness of seating at the range of the intimate scale comes to the foreground knowing that theater seating such as these will not be filled to capacity for some time. 
More recently, the Berliner Ensemble Theater decided to be proactive and change their seating to reflect the physical distance bubble by removing seats. At the same time, it will also rely on everyone wearing a mask to truly work. The last chapter of the book bridges the threshold of interior and exterior. Gordon Mata Clark's project splitting took a literal section cut of a full scale house to reveal the inside. So I decided to also cut the diagram at the same layers to see how the diagram would look. It is like standing at a precipice of a diagram and opens up the question of what can be inferred from a section cut such as this. I don't have the answer, but hope that this talk will help, help offer newer views of the interior and strategies for what we have to come. Thank you.